to the intervention. But I'm going to talk about two locations that uh, very often people find difficult to biopsy. I know that many of you as surgeons do your own biopsies or work very closely with the radiologist. So maybe this would be of help in the future. So let's look at this case, a 53-year-old with neck pain and a C3 uh, vertebral body lesion. Um, and you can see the uh, osteolytic lesion here. There's a small fracture as well. It was an expansile lesion, nothing specific about the lesion. It could be a plasma cytoma, metastasis, you know, the usual differential that we have, uh, inclusive of a giant cell tumor at this age. And you can see what it looks like on the CT scan. Now, the question is, how do you biopsy a lesion like this? Do you go transoral, which is very messy? Do you go behind the internal jugular vein? Do you go between the artery and vein or do you find some space in front of the submandibular gland and try and go in here? And the trick is to just turn the head to the opposite side. Uh, obviously, you have to do a contrast study to see where the vessels are. And you can see that if I were to turn the head and then go behind the internal jugular vein, that's the vertebral artery. I have a good enough space to, to do that. Now, when I actually did the study, I, I did this under sedation and my anesthetist who sits at the head end also helped push the head down a little bit. All right. So now you can see that that's the internal jugular vein. I have enough space to go through. And that was then an extremely easy biopsy to do. You can do the same thing in decubitus as well. So that's not a problem, except that sedation and decubitus can become a challenge. And then the diagnosis here turned out to be plasma cytoma. So that's with the upper cervical spine, C3 and C4. What if you have something in C6, 7? And I'm going to show you a case of infectious spondylitis because I, I don't have an anterior vertebral body lesion to show, but the principle is the same. Um, and this works for C5, 6, 7, D1. Uh, that's the CT scan. And you can see that that's the lesion you need to go to. And what are your approaches? Do you go between the trachea and the thyroid? Do you go through the thyroid? Do you go behind the internal jugular vein? Or do you make the patient decubitus and take this tortuous approach? And this is used, okay? So it's not something that I've made up here. And what I have learned, and we've done a few cases now, that the transthyroid is the safest, right? So the Vessels are here, the trachea is here. There's nothing that comes in the way. Your vertebral is here. The only thing you have to be careful about is going through the middle part of the gland because superiorly you have the superior thyroid artery that comes in the way and inferiorly you have the inferior thyroid artery. So you could create a pseudaneurysm there. But if you go through the middle of the gland, it works brilliantly. So that's exactly what we did, went into the vertebral body and there it is, you've got your answer. Uh, or you've got the material. This turned out to be strep. But like I said, if you had an osteolytic lesion in the same area, the transthyroid gland root, it's not been described in the literature as such, but we're not able to publish it as well because every time we send it off, some interventional radiologist sends it by, oh, but I've done three or four, so big deal, you know, and, and that's how um, it's been. So that was as far as uh, difficult biopsies in the cervical spine are concerned. Now let's look at RFA. We know that RFA is used for these conditions. Um, Osteoarthritis. now it's been almost 18, 19 years that we've been doing this. And these are the standard uh, uh, areas that we ablate. But the spine is an area where people still have trouble. And I'll show you one example of how we circumvent these issues. And again, something you can do as well. It's very simple. So 20-year-old has this osteoarthritis along the inferior articular facet of D10. You can see that there's a, the, it's touching the nerve or it's kind of close to the nerve. It's touching the uh, dura, but that's, there is enough space uh, uh, you know, when it comes to the cord. But if you look at the CT, there's no cortex of the bone around it. So that's the osteoarthritis itself. It's exophytic. And so when I'm burning this, the question is, can I make sure that I don't um, uh, ablate the nerve or injure the nerve? I'm not so much worried about the cord because the CSF is a good conductor or, or rather is a good insulator as well. 
but nevertheless, we have a technique that can help with this. So what I did is I put a needle just at the foramen, injected a lot of air. Now, the moment there's air here, we've created insulation and air is a great insulator as far as heat is concerned. Um, and there are specks of air here. And, and you'll see that we kept injecting air. Um, as we went in, now I've gone uh, with the 11 gauge needle, I've been, uh, you know, uh, uh, put in a K wire, transferred for the sh with the shielded needle. And now that's the electrode inside. And you can see that I've got air in the foramen, I've got air in the epidural space, and these should be neuroprotective. Final injection of air, and then I remove the needle while ablation because I don't want too much metal to be present there. And then the ablation was done 90 degrees, four minutes, and the patient is fine. So just an example of how we can use some simple techniques uh, to circumvent problems and, and manage all of this. And so the patient is pain free. We know that we do the same with osteoblastoma, with chondroblastoma. That is an osteoblastoma of the rib, a very simple RFA here. And that's a chondroblastoma of the greater trochanter. And again, very simple. And even today, I don't think we ablate anything more than two centimeters. Though, you know, plus minus a few millimeters is absolutely fine. Lastly, um, I'd like to talk about cryoablation. Um, this is a 46 year old with a four years history of fibromatosis. I have done two RFAs for her. She's been on metronomic therapy. She's on methotrexate. She's controlled, but she has pain. And you can see on the axial MR, this classic um, extra abdominal desmoid, as they call it. We're not supposed to use the term fibromatosis as per the new WHO. Um, classification, but you know, that is the standard common term that we use. So that's on the sagittal images here. And I thought we could get about 70-80% uh, of the tumor ablated. Now, cryoablation actually, they did a study in France called cryodesmo for 50 patients of extra abdominal desmoid tumors with prior treatment and which didn't work. And 86% of them had non-progressive disease at 12 months with reduced pain and better functional status. So the treatment does seem to work. And so we have this machine now that uses liquid um, nitrogen. Uh, that's typically how we create the, the lethal zone. And you can see the ice ball here that we have to check for first um, in, in, in the water. And it takes about 45 minutes per cycle. So you freeze first, then you thaw, then you freeze again. Um, and you can see this was the first one and you can actually see the ice ball. And the advantage of cryo, which we've seen in the liver as well over RFA is that you know what you're ablating. With RFA, it's always a conjecture. You just assume that you've um, ablated whatever you have because you know that uh, that's the zone of ablation, but you don't see it. Here you can see the ice ball forming. Uh, and then we did a second one. And again, you can see this hypodense ice ball around uh, the electrode. So this was the first ablation. That was the second ablation. That's what it all looks like. Then the patient came back a week later. We called the patient for a uh, follow-up. And you can see how this entire area has become dark. That's the diffusion and at least two thirds of it has been ablated. That's on the contrast and about two thirds has been ablated. The patient's fine. Her pain is not completely gone away, but she says she feels better. We're going to keep monitoring her and then see if we can offer her something more if uh, she doesn't improve. But, you know, this is a patient who we've been tackling now for quite some time and surgery is still not an option. Um, given the location and given what it looks like. So that was the plan today. I didn't want to go into too much of data, um, which my earlier talks on the same subject have had, but I thought it's just a good idea to share technique. Two difficult biopsies, on rather difficult if you are unsure. The moment you have a handle on the technique, they're no longer difficult. So I've given a plan for managing biopsies, anterior vertebral bi body biopsies at C3, C4, and at C5, 6 to C7, D1. We've looked at RFA, and I've shown you an example of the spine where we used air to insulate the nerve um, and to protect it from heat, and cryoablation, which is a new technique. I mean, uh, there are currently only three machines in the country, and so uh, this is something that 
should become more popular simply because you can see what you're ablating and in some areas this works better uh, than RFA. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. That was a that was really a, a very nice and really something which is uh, new even for us, sir. I have a question, uh, sir. In uh, uh, patients uh, where we have had some patients where the chondroblastoma in difficult locations like uh, head of the femur or uh, acetabulum was ablated and there was a thermal damage uh, to the uh, to the cartilage. Uh, so, do we have anything? Uh, just you showed that you inject air. Uh, while uh, you know doing an ablation of uh, osteostium of spine, something like that, do we have to pro to prevent cartilage damage uh, no. while uh, doing RF ablation to chondroblastomas? Because the cartilage is just there, no, it's an epiphyseal lesion. Um, I think it's more technique based. I I think if we could. Um, so have you personally seen chondrolysis happening? Uh, yes, I I have had one patient where. Uh, yeah. And we, we, I mean, at uh, Tata Memorial also, they have a couple of patients uh, of proximal femur. Where right, right. I've so seen I, it I, I, I am not sure if it's partly technique based, you know, where one of the tines goes out and touches the cartilage. Um, I don't think there's a way to avoid it. I don't think there are any protective measures that we can take. Perhaps a little less weight bearing initially. I'm not too sure because the few that I have done, we've never even had weight bearing. We just ask them to resume their normal activities. And I think it's just touch wood. I've been a little lucky. Um, but I remember the first time the UK guys came and spoke about RFA, uh, you know, about six or seven years ago, uh, their main concern was the same, chondrolysis. And, and I guess we just have to be careful. I, I don't know if there's a way out here. Uh, Amit, uh, are you ready now? My my screen visible now? Mm, not to me, at least. Not yet, no. Uh, just a minute. Anyone else has any question for Dr. Jankaria? Uh, uh, so, so we have something like a microwave or uh, technique for uh, the osteoastomas or microwave ablation of osteoastomas, something yeah. like that. What, so, what microwave, is that so microwave uses uh, the microwave technology. So you have an antenna and, and an electrode and you do it. Uh, the challenge I have found is that there is no difference between microwave and RFA as far as, the, I mean, both are thermal ablation techniques. There's no advantage of microwave over RFA. So I just don't see the point. Um, there, there, is a, there is a company that's become very aggressive right now in marketing. And so suddenly there's a spurt of microwave uh, ablations that are happening in lung, liver. Um, and I think a couple of people have done osteoastomas as well. Um, it's more expensive. And so I just don't see the point. So there is a question uh, uh, for you. What is the risk of thyroiditis post <laughs> Transthyroid biopsy for cervical lesions. So before I did this, I um, I checked with the endocrinologist um, and asked them, you know, it, is it okay to do this or not? Because I mean, you're going through a gland. I mean, we go through bone to reach soft tissue. We've done. We go transhepatic for pancreas. We go transgastric, trans sometimes colonic. All of that, you know, transcapular to hit lung, but we've never done transthyroid. And um, so when I and Amit, I think if Amit has a new Mac that is not used for Zoom before, no, sir. Actually, I have taken one uh, DNB webinar for uh, from WebEx. After that, I think the system has altered, so there is some issue. I will try to sort it out. Yeah, because this I, you have to give permission in system setting for Zoom to be used. I remember two years ago, we had the same problem when we all started out with Zoom. Um, or you can just send your PPT to, you know, Mandeep and then they can play it and you can yeah, that's, that's, that's a good event. We'll do that. We'll do that. Yeah, send me the PPT and uh, till then we can ask Akshay to take his talk. Akshay? Dr. Akshay Tiwari? 
Yeah, hi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, good morning. So Akshay is going to talk about uh, what are the uh, the newer developments in the management of giant cell tumor, uh, or are there really any? So uh, Akshay, all yours. Yeah, is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. It's visible. So, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mandeep, for letting me part of this uh, nice uh, program lined up today. Uh, as you said, uh, at the first look of it, one doesn't seem to think that uh, you know things have really changed as far as treatment of giant cell tumor of bone are concerned. And here we are talking about uh, the last two decades, if I'm not wrong. So let us look at the debates that, you know, one gets confronted with when uh, looking at the giant cell tumor of bone, uh, starting right from the diagnosis, uh, whether to curate or resect, whether with or without adjuvants, uh, whether to cement or to fill it with bone graft, uh, whether to fix or not, whether to have a location-based strategy uh, when trying to treat or manage a case with a giant cell tumor. And last but definitely not the least is uh, whether uh, pharmacological treatment has made advances in the last two decades. And we'll just try and see uh, what all uh, we have learned in the last two decades as far as these points are concerned. A lot uh, really has been done in terms of diagnosis uh, by way of immunohistochemical characterization and uh, at the molecular level. But I think the most uh, useful of these has been the utility of histone 3.3 mutant specific antibodies. Uh, they've not only let us make a more uh, confident diagnosis of giant cell tumor per se, they have been uh, positive in recurrent metastatic giant cell tumors post inosumab. And giant cell tumors, which were which had a secondary malignancy, and this was very useful to differentiate them from a de novo sarcoma having a giant cell rich uh, appearance. So uh, that is one. Uh, then coming to curate or to resect, uh, we know that uh, resection has been a favorite with a lot of people, especially in the past, knowing fully well that resection will give us a more uh, oncologically sound treatment with much lower rates of recurrence. But we also know that these tumors being juxtaarticular, resection is going to mean either a prosthesis or an arthrodesis of some kind. And uh, not many studies and uh, work uh, has been um, published recently as far as resection is concerned. But of course, everyone would agree that you must resect when you can, given that the morbidity of your resection is acceptable and will usually not require any reconstruction. This very excellent review as recent as August 2021 looked at uh, a systematic review of the functional oncological outcomes uh, and they compared curatage with resection. And obviously the functional advantage, the huge functional advantage that curatage gives us is much larger than the increased risk of recurrence that curatage holds. So let us look at what we would do in today's times when faced with a, a, a giant cell tumor of the distal end of femur, a very common location. On the left is, of course, a, a Campanacci stage 2 giant cell tumor. And in the middle is a Campanacci grade 3 giant cell tumor. On the right is a multiply operated multi recurrent giant cell tumor in a in a in an old lady. So uh, of course the cross sectional imaging gives us more idea, and uh, everyone would agree that curatage is the way to go for the lesion on the left side. But uh, the lesion on the middle, uh, there will be a lot of scope for discussion, and that is where a good counselling uh, with the patient comes in handy. And um, all literature points out that this is not an absolute contraindication for curatage as well. And that is what was done in this case also. On the left, a curatage, cementing and fixation. The middle, again, curatage and cementing. Uh, as far as the surgeon and the patient are fully aware that the risk of recurrence is a little higher. 
and the one on the side was treated with a resection and a prosthesis. Uh, what about pathological fractures? Of course, pathological fractures are again uh, a relative contraindication and have conventionally been uh, kept as uh, something that should not be treated with curettage. But again, we have some body of literature pointing towards curettage being possible and having acceptable results as compared to uh, resection, particularly in uh, the younger patients. This was a patient with a pathological fracture. This was uh, operated again uh, about six years back or even more. And uh, after all the counseling, uh, curettage and fixation of the fracture was resorted to. And that's the follow up six years later. We do have some osteoarthritis developing, but the patient still is doing fine. Uh, and that brings us uh, to another very important aspect that is being, uh, you know, repeatedly discussed in the last decade or so, and that is the technique of curettage. And everyone now agrees that uh, uh, an extended curettage with burring is is an absolute must, and a simple curettage without burring is going to be uh, facing a, a much higher risk of local recurrence. So that burring is absolutely essential. And the next question as to the use of surgical adjuvants in giant cell tumor uh, when you are doing a curettage, an increasingly uh, large body of literature is now pointing towards adjuvants not actually having uh, any definitive role in the local control. Most of these studies now tell us that uh, whether you do and use an adjuvant or not is not probably going to decide whether you are going to have a local recurrence. It's actually the technique of curettage that really matters. But again, the cement has been shown to have some adjuvant effect and some effect on reducing the risk of recurrence. And again, there have also been proponents of both liquid nitrogen and things like phenol as well, even in uh, not so old literature. What about cement and bone grafting? And Mandeep and I had a good uh, debate in, in IMSOS at Bangalore regarding this. And this remains the eternal debate in giant cell tumor again. Um, if we look at uh, work done in last decade or so, or even two decades, I think cement uh, has gained popularity generally, mostly because the, the perils of cementation that were initially uh, proposed are proving to be not true uh, actually. So uh, it, it gives us a instant filler. It gives us uh, an adjuvant effect. Uh, it lets the patient bear weight immediately. It's available and it's quite cheap. Uh, a lot of work again says that cement does improve the rate of uh, 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 local control. And this recent meta-analysis also showed uh, that uh, cement actually reduces the risk of local recurrence. And that is a huge advantage. Uh, again, the Scandinavian scar sarcoma study group points towards the same outcome. Uh, so what about osteoarthritis? Uh, the main uh, the main uh, disadvantage of cement that has been proposed is the development of osteoarthritis, probably resulting from the thermal damage to subcondyl bone. But again, there is more and more work pointing towards the fact that it's not generally the cement, but the, the, the disease causing damage to the subcondyl bone, which actually leads to osteoarthritis. The initial invasion grade is the real risk factor. And this has been shown by not one, but many workers. So again, uh, the, the ease of going, doing a primary totally arthroplasty uh, after cementing has again been a concern, but that also has been disproved by workers. But uh, at the same time, bone grafts will continue to have its own proponents. It's uh, biological, it can remodel, get uh, incorporated very easily. And uh, uh, this study as late as 2017 again shows that supplemental bone grafting will actually reduce the non-oncological complications. And this needs to be kept in mind uh, while discussing the options with the patient. What about skeletally immature patients? Even skeletally immature patients have been shown to, to do well with cementing as uh, the method of reconstruction. A, point, uh, a case in point where this patient underwent a curettage in December 15, 
and this is how she has behaved over the years and uh, has been doing quite well as late as 2020. The, this debate then brought into picture the sandwich technique where you want to have the best of both worlds, both for bone grafting as and for cementing. And uh, the, the, the hypothesis was that subchondral bone, if replaced by bone, will lead to a lesser of damage to the articular cartilage. And this technique continues to be popular with a lot of people and literature continues to come out uh, with, about this technique. Whether to fill or not to fill has also been questioned and answered satisfactorily and in selected patients, even not filling the cavity after curettage remains an option. So to choose between bone graft or cement, one would look at the age, the size, the subchondral bone health and the extent of subchondral bone remaining, uh, the location of the lesion, whether weight bearing or non weight bearing presence of a, uh, the availability of a bone bank. And then of course, personal preference will matter when you choose between bone graft or cement to fix or not to fix. Again, people have tried to come out with objective ways of predicting whether this patient needs a fixation or not, but I'm not sure these uh, algorithms and scoring systems have proved uh, very valuable in, in the practical world. At least I did not find them so, and uh, it uh, usually remains subjective uh, to the surgeon's uh, evaluation of the patient, whether he goes on to fix or not. Do you want to treat GCTS specific locations differently? The answer is definitely yes. Uh, in case of proximal femur, uh, we know that, that the risk of recurrence is a little higher, but the world literature is moving a little more towards curettage because of the obvious advantages of saving the femoral head in these young patients. And so similarly, uh, about the sacrum, a uh, lot of uh, work to uh, continues to refine the surgical treatment of uh, giant cell tumor of sacrum, even in recent literature. But at the same time, quite a few of them will present as massive as this. And uh, there is an increasing work which now suggests that embolization with or without denosumab or zoledronic acid is the way to go for uh, uh, sacral tumors, which you cannot resect without causing significant morbidity. Again, with the pelvis, uh, most of the literature now points towards an unblocked resection doing much better, even if it's involving the acetabulum, and that should always be kept in mind when making a decision. But in any case, uh, patients who do not have the acetabular involvement with giant cell tumor would do much better with an unblocked resection rather than uh, a curettage. Again, a GCT of the iliac bone, which was uh, treated with denosumab before surgery and a navigation assisted resection was done, which enabled us to uh, uh, remove uh, the giant cell tumor unblock. The loss of pelvic ring was made up uh, by with the patient having to bear weight on this and then eventually fused. So patient doing well now. Similarly, for GCT of spine, unblocked resection is now being favored much more than curettage because we all know, given the location and the, uh, the type of lesions that the spine uh, has, curettage will have much higher rates of local recurrence. So an unblocked resection in vertebrectomy is being proposed as a favored treatment. But uh, you'll uh, have one of patient like this who chose to have definitive denosumab therapy. She has been on denosumab treatment with uh, now uh, for almost a year and doing quite well, although the, uh, the MR suggests that there is a significant collapse of the D1 vertebra, but the patient is fine and has refused surgery. Similarly, for foot and hand, we know that these locations carry uh, much higher recurrence rates than other more common locations. And uh, conventionally, there have been suggestions to uh, prefer resection over curettage, but again, there is more and more work showing that it's not actually aggressive or any more aggressive than the other locations, and it should be treated on its own merit when deciding between curettage and resection. A case is in point where this multiply recurrent GCT of hand uh, with where the patient after, uh, after counseling chose to have a ray amputation, and the one on the right was, was a Campanacci stage two where the patient did well with the curettage and bone grafting. Similarly, for the foot, 
on the left side is a uh, is a giant cell tumor involving almost the whole of the metatarsal and on the right again the first metatarsal but multiply operated the one on the right was treated with resection and the one of the on the left uh, did well with good long term control on curettage and cementing again distal radius continues to be uh, known as uh, uh, an area where the risk of recurrence will be high and uh, most of the work if we look at the literature in 90s was around resection and the ways to reconstruct but more and more work now in the recent recent literature does show that they will do much better with curettage than with resection and again curettage should be given a preference of course as long as the patient and the surgeon know that the risk of recurrence is a little higher than other locations the one on the left side was treated with curettage and one on the right obviously was treated first with denosumab followed by uh, resection and radialization of ulna that's on the left the is an x-ray about 6 or 7 years follow up and the one on the right is also a long term follow up what about proximal humerus uh, everyone agrees that curettage will have much better uh, outcome than uh, resection and most of the work has been about how to reconstruct and the umbrella construct from the tmh group and is an interesting way of uh, reconstructing again the one on the left was treated with curettage and the one on the right again was multiple surgeries uh, post multiple surgeries treated with denosumab consolidated and then we could do an axillary nerve sparing resection and a reverse shoulder with good function and one on the left obviously was treated with curettage and a combination of cement and bone graft and she also did well in the long term uh, then comes the curious case of zoledronic acid and uh, denosumab and a lot of work i think i don't think more work than denosumab has been done in any other aspect of giant cell tumor in the last 10 years or so it all of course zoledronic acid was being used by uh, much much earlier by workers much earlier and we do have kc wong and i think he would be listening and no one would know better that they induce bisphosphonates induce apoptosis of stromal tumor cells and they are probably the ones who actually affect the tumor cells rather than the osteoclasts themselves and it was shown that they actually reduce local recurrence in the clinical setting as well but there have been reports showing the contrarian view where uh, they did not actually find zoledronic acid decreasing the recurrence rates so all this needs still to be settled and then comes denosumab uh, it entered back in 2010 with this report where further investigation was recommended as far as use of denosumab uh, therapy for gct was uh, concerned and again the same uh, the same group with dr san chavla came with this phase 2 trial and uh, we, they could say that denosumab works pretty well on giant cell tumors and then again more and more body of literature kept collecting which showed that denosumab works excellently in the short term and even in the mid term in in uh, controlling giant cell tumor of bone with very good ossification we can see here the giant cells uh, and the stromal tumor cells in the usual histopathological picture of gct and this is what happens after denosumab where there is just woven bone and fibrous stroma and the giant cells are not to be seen anymore so the indications for denosumab as we see today are inoperable giant cell tumor of bone uh, gct where surgery may be associated with considerable morbidity for example uh, the sacral gcts uh, multicentric giant cell tumors gct with pulmonary meds and refractory and recurrent giant cell tumors but uh, along with the excitement that denosumab got we all know that it also got with it a lot of concern and that is also being addressed a lot in uh, today's literature and it is known that as soon as you stop denosumab therapy there will be usually a rapid uh, re recurrence or progression in the tumor but uh, one more concern has been that if you choose to curate a tumor after denosumab the recurrence rates might be much higher than you otherwise ex expect uh, there have been views mostly for more local recurrence but this paper particularly says they did not find any uh, higher local recurrence with uh, denosumab than without again this patient had a multicentric giant cell tumor and we know denosumab uh, this is one of the one of the most specific indications for use of denosumab and she has been on uh, definitive denosumab therapy what we have been doing is 
Uh, it's now been six years or more uh, since she has been on denosumab. All the lesions are ossified. And what we are doing is increasing the duration between the denosumab uh, injections. We don't have particular literature to say how it should be done. I think it has to be tailor-made as per the clinical situation. Another uh, patient with multicentric giant cell tumor, and we can see the lesions ossifying very well, and the patient is painless, again, quite a few years into denosumab therapy. So how do we compare denosumab with zoledronic acid? Uh, again, uh, the same group uh, showed that uh, denosumab actually doesn't work that much on the neoplastic stromal cells, whereas zoledronic acid does. And that makes a lot of sense in choosing zoledronic acid in the post-operative period, if at all, uh, rather than denosumab. In fact, another work which showed that denosumab treatment, even if having similar tumor responses, was markedly more expensive, and we all know that. Uh, an odd case report where sustained long-term complete regression has been reported is only anecdotal, and we all know that the moment you stop denosumab, uh, giant cell tumors will start regrowing. Uh, lung metastasis are also uh, uh, another indication for giants uh, for denosumab in use uh, being used in giant cell tumor and this patient as we can see had multiple lung mets and this is what happened with the uh, uh, denosumab all the lesions have regressed in size is absolutely asymptomatic and he again is on a definitive denosumab therapy sarcomatous transformation has been a concern and has been reported in some patients the significance of this report is not really known and another big concern with denosumab is if you and your patient choose to go for definitive denosumab therapy, how long are you going to uh, continue denosumab is still remains a question. And how, what is going to do in terms of side effects in the long run is also uh, a question that has not been answered. To, uh, to come to the conclusion of my uh, talk, uh, what has changed in all this while as we stand today? Well, uh, not really much, I would say in principle. But yes, some subtle changes definitely have uh, are there. All Kampanachi stage two, most stage uh, stage one, or most stage two, and some selective stage three will go for curettage, and only some would go for resection. Extended curettage with a high speed bar is highly recommended. Adjuvants may be used, but definitive evidence is lacking. And if someone is not using adjuvants, uh, one cannot deny that. Polymethyl methacrylate, uh, that is bone cement, can be used, or bone grafts, or uh, hydroxyapatite bone graft substitutes can also be used to fill these defects. Pathological fractures, Campanati stage 3, and recurrent giant cell tumor are not absolute contraindications of curettage as uh, it stands today. Judicious use of bisphosphonates and denosumab, we are getting to know more and more about these two drugs and getting wiser as to how and when we should use them and what cautions we should have while you are using them. We know uh, denosumab is safe and effective for short-term and even mid-term use, but long-term use still remains to be established. And we also know the moment you stop denosumab, some definitive treatment is required. It could be angioembolization, it could be radiotherapy or surgery. Effect of long-term denosumab still needs to be seen. I think that is all, uh, this being quite a large and vast topic uh, I'm open to questions and thank you again. Thank you, Akshay, uh, for that uh, uh, exhaustive, exhaustive literature review. I must uh, congratulate you. It was, it must have been a uh, tough thing to for you to, uh, you know, do. But you have taken us through all the uh, uh, areas of uh, giant cell tumor and the controversies around it. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions for Ak uh, Akshay? Maybe we, we can take up one or two questions at the most. Uh, so Akshay, there is a question uh, whether you have any experience in using a ceramic that is from Pratik. Yeah, hi Pratik and thank you for asking that question. I do have uh, experience with using ceramic. The uh, huge advantage is that it uh, hardens like cement as soon as uh, it sets and at the same time gets resolved with time uh, and becomes just bone. The problem that I have faced and I know many others have also faced is the continuous oozing of whitish discharge that happens through the wound in quite a few of these patients. And the second concern, of course, is the cost. 
Cerement also comes with the uh, antibiotic uh, loaded form. And I have used it uh, that as well uh, for infected uh, cases. So that is uh, what I have to tell you about experience with Cerement. I would be happy to know if you have anything. All right, Akshay, thank you very much. Uh, Amit. Uh, One more question I have, I have got. Uh, I, I can share my screen now. It's uh, working. Okay, okay. Then I'll, I'll, I'll stop Akshay, sharing. I want to have one question. Uh, if you are curating a lesion in the distal femur, as you said, we uh, talked about both sandwich technique and only cement. What would you prefer or what will be your advice in between these two? Whether sandwich technique or only uh, cement? So, uh, very good question and very practical. Uh, it would usually depend on my assessment of uh, how much subchondral bone is going to remain after I have completed my curettage. If it's uh, more than 5 or more than 8 mm, uh, definitely only cement. I don't need bone there. If it's, uh, say, uh, some subchondral bone which is weak, I would want to add subchondral bone in form of a sandwich technique there. But if it's just bare cartilage, we've seen that if we add bone graft, the chances of uh, intraarticular fracture are very high. Again, I, I go with just cement in that case. Okay. Okay, I think Amit, uh, it's time that we start your talk. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Mandeep. And uh, sorry for the trouble uh, because of the WebEx link. So we can start. Uh, so I'm going to talk about next 20 size uh, regarding the recent advances that has happened in the imaging modalities in the bone tumor. So the general outline that we follow is that we should have knowledge about the patient history, the knowledge of the physical examination, whether the lesion has been symptomatic or it has been incidentally picked up. All this makes a lot of difference. Usually uh, radiographs will be the first line of imaging and part and parcel of uh, physical examination. And they could be diagnostic where you don't require further workup and you might need further imaging and there could be a need of biopsies. Based on this thing, we try to classify these lesions, whether it is an aggressive or non-aggressive. And MR is particularly useful where the radiographs are normal or either they are non-diagnostics. Typically, these lesions will be... Uh, apologies, Dr. Amir. We can't see the slides. Yeah, we can't see the slides, Amir. So you can share on the it, it shows that it is sharing the slide. No, it is not. It's sharing your desktop, possibly. Yeah. Let's try and share again. Uh have you sent the PPT to Mandeep? He I can have sent share it. it. Mandeep, yes, you can I share it. PPT. Yeah, Mandeep share. Share and he can talk. Okay, just a second. I'll I'll have to open his I just go ahead, sir. Just a second. sharing my screen in that case yes sir Just, can you see my screen it's coming. Coming. yes ah, sir. yeah mm, yeah 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 we are seeing it just a second yeah it's opening powerpoint is opening yeah, yeah. That's it. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. Can you make it full actually? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's just, okay. Just, Amit, you tell me when to uh, run the... I will, I will say next slide, then you just... Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. So we all know that uh, we should have a general outline regarding the bone tumors. First is the patient history. Second is the phys physical examination. And whether the lesion was symptomatically picked up or it was an incidental... And the radiographs will now, as a part and parcel of uh, physical examination and the first line of imaging, we could have three answers from the radiographs, whether it is a diagnostic, we don't require further workup, or we require further workup, or we need an tissue sampling. So based on radiographs, we try to characterize these lesions as aggressive and non-aggressive. MR will be particularly helpful, either the radiograph is normal, or uh, when there are non-diagnostic radiographs, and typically that will happen in case when there, we have lytic lesions and marrow-based lesions. CT is have a limited role, uh, particularly when we try to characterize a matrix or we want to pick up osteodosteoma and stress fractures. 
next slide please so we know that age is uh, extremely essential and crucial component in uh, diagnosis of these bone tumors second if we pick up the lesion then we try to characterize which part of the bone is involved what is the location within the bone the two most important criteria whether there is what is the lesion margins that will tell about the rate of the growth and the presence and character of the periosteal reaction and associated whether there is any kind of matrix that will tell whether it is an osteoid chondroid or fibrous and if there is a soft tissue component it will further add whether we are dealing with an aggressive lesion next slide please next slide uh, just next slide. just a second amit yeah so we have a scenario where we might have encountered with normal x ray then particularly in this this is the pathology resident she is having pain in the foot and then we try to do because the radiograph has been normal next slide please and we see that when we ordered an mr we after two months we have find out there is a marrow edema and there is a subtle hypotense line that we can see on the mr next slide please and that why we have confirmed that probably it is related to stress fracture and then you will see in the follow up x ray there is an uh, peri solid periosteal reaction in the november 2016 x ray so we might encounter most of the times we can encounter metastatic lesions where the radiographs are normal we might have round cell tumors where the radiographs are normal and then we can pleasantly surprise by the mri and we can pick up these lesions next slide so typically we can have non diagnostic radiographs where mr might help in picking up the lesion it will characterize the lesion and it will also tell about the extent of the lesion so you will see that there is a radiograph here in the march 2016 where there is a subtle metaphyseal widening apart from that there is no abnormality it has been picked up uh, just uh, an incident finding next slide please and you will see that there is an Uh, i think somebody's voice is echoing so we can see that it gives an hyperintense signal and next slide please next slide so we'll see that these are the set of images we will do star we will try to pick up abnormal normality and then on t2 we try to characterize and then contrast will help in identifying these lesions so this is an and chondroma that is the and it is long and we are continuously following up this uh, on x ray next please there is another set of uh, images where the radiographs are uh, just showing lytic lesions but not able to characterize it and by mr it will help to uh, know that the next one is a cartilaginous lesions which is showing typical lobular cartilaginous enhancement that's been completely good echo is coming echo is coming i think uh, apart from speaker everybody has to mute so i think that will solve the issue hello now it's okay hello yeah, yeah it's okay now yeah. it's okay so we can see that it is showing a typical cartilaginous enhancement in the third set of image that is very classical for uh, cartilaginous lesions and we will diagnose these lesions based on these uh, typical enhancement patterns in the next uh, slide you can see that uh, there is an osteolytic lesion that is there in the still tuberosity and it will have complete fluid fill levels that is very classical for aneurysmal bone cyst so mr not only uh, help in characterization it also tell about the extent or whether the lesion is we are dealing with an aggressive or it is a non aggressive lesion next slide please uh, apart from that uh, there is some uh, information that is only available on mr is that there is an edema so edema component we can only see on mr and if the lesion is looking benign on x ray and we see an marrow edema then it is a benign aggressive lesion or we might find out something else that will tell whether the lesion is aggressive so you will see there is a lucent nidus here and then there is subtle sclerosis the moment you do mr you can find out there is an exponential amount of edema so all lesions which are having edema will require some kind of intervention to relieve the pain next slide please so this is a classical case of osteodystomy you can look for the nidus cortical based nidus in this x ray and these lesions are typically very active on pat as well next slide please second thing uh, is the dynamic contrast enhanced uh, imaging 
So if you see that you can see a uh, locate in IDAS, but sometimes uh, the NIDAS are very not well formed. It could be a small cortical abscesses versus an osteodostuma. If you are not having a doubt on the CT, then you can plan a dynamic contrast and summary and it will give rise to typical, you can see the kind of enhancement is similar to that of the vessels. So that kind of information you will get from MR and it is very diagnostic for uh, osteodostumas. Sometimes uh, where you want to plan, if it is a necrotic tumor and you want to know where exactly there is an area where you have to biopsy, then these uh, will help you. So it will tell you which is the area which is having uh, most vascularity or a most representable area that you can target it. Next slide, please. So we have sometimes uh, come across uh, the findings in which the radiographs looks to be diagnostic, but the moment we do NMR, we find a googly or another type of diagnosis that will come up. So there are two radiographs. Most of the people on the first radiographs is called is a fibrous dysplasia with a pathological fracture. The second, it has been perceived as giant cell tumor. Next slide, please. If we see the first radiograph, it looks to be cystic. So if you see that it is a very T2 hyper intense lesion, but in the uh, cross-sectional image, if you see, you can see the floating membranes within. It is an hydrated cyst of the bone and it will clearly, the lesion is benign. There is no periosteal reaction. There is no marrow edema. The zones are very sharply well-defined. So actually, though it is looking like a fibrous dysplasia, it is actually a uh, cyst and that is an hydratosis. Sec uh, next slide, please. It looks like it was giant cell timer, but it's too hypointense. It shows almost intense homogeneous enhancement in all the area and it is a fibrous lesion. It is a fibrous dysplasia. So if we see that we can encounter uh, some surprises in MR and this is the area where it is particularly useful when you want to characterize cyst versus fibrous dysplasia can mimic each other on X-ray, but MR over almost 99% uh, it will differentiate between the cyst and the fibrous tissue. Next slide, please. So apart from that, even though we know that on X-ray it looks to be very aggressive, it will help in narrowing the differential, whether it is going to be an infection or it is going to be a neoplastic etiology. So you can have in the second image, it will show that there is a serpentine T1 hyperintense area. There is a lot of necrotic lymphadenopathy and then there is a joint involvement. So all this will indicate that we are dealing with an aggressive lesion, but it is going to be an infection. In this particular case, it turned out to be an tuberculous osteomyelitis. Next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, this is the patient uh, in which there was a pain and uh, it has been reported as fibrous cortical uh, defect. And the patient has been sent home that there is nothing to worry. But after that, it came back after 15 days and then uh, there is sudden increase in the size of the swelling. The ultrasound has been performed because there was nothing obvious on the X-ray and there is a soft tissue swelling that is seen. So the ultrasound has been done. Based on the ultrasound, they picked up a lesion and they tried to uh, done an FNAC. On FNAC, it has been reported as osteogenic sarcoma. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Just, just a second, just a second. So, so we can see that sometimes we will uh, miss the finding on the X-rays and how MR uh, will help in formulate the diagnosis. So you can see that there is an MR and you can see that there is an uh, T1 and T2 hypointense lesion with an exorbitant amount of edema to the soft tissues. So if you have that kind of picture, probably one has to think if it is a history of trauma, whether we are dealing with a myositis ossificans. Next slide, please. And then instead of further uh, doing a repeat biopsy, we advise him to follow up. And then we can see that there is a maturation in case of myositis ossificans. Next slide, please. So you can see that it is further matures. So MR not only uh, help in uh, picking up the lesions, it is also helping in narrow down your differentials and sometimes giving a diagnostic clue what is happening and it will also help in planning for the biopsies. Next slide, please. The other uh, set of developments that has happened and now we are trying to incorporate these changes in our routine uh, sequences. One is the chemical shift imaging uh, where we acquire, it is a non-contrast image where we'll try to incorporate in-phase and out-phase imaging. So if there is a suspicion of stick lesion, or it's a marrow replacing lesion, then we uh, see that there is a signal drop that is happening in the out-phase images. 
and that almost virtually uh, 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 not like a histopathology, but it uh, if there is an other supporting modality like PET, it will tell that we are probably dealing with an skip metastasis or whether it is an uh, if it is not suppressing on the uh, post saturation images, it will tell that we are probably dealing with the red marrow or some kind of just inflammation post chemo. Next slide, please. Next slide. So you can see that the same lesion which shows significant drop. So if you see that kind of drop in out phase images, then it means uh, that lesion is a marrow replacing lesion or it is going to be a skip metastasis in this cell. Uh, next slide, please. So we will encounter these marrow replacing regions uh, very frequently and uh, where we have to give whether uh, these linear densities or uh, rounded lesions, whether they are skip or they are just in routine inflammatory changes. And another thing that uh, will help in uh, narrow down your uh, differentials is the uh, previous slide, please. Uh, so that is the susceptibility weighting imaging and the diffusion weighted images. Diffusion will tell you particularly whether the lesion is having high cellularity. So it will give about the index of the high cellularity that is particularly seen in aving sarcoma, uh, small round, uh, small cell sarcomas, or it is going into the lymphomas. So you will see a drop in the signal and then it will formulate a diagnosis. Susceptibility will tell whether the lesion is having hemorrhage. So it will give you some diagnostic clue whether it, the lesion is going to be an aggressive soft tissue lesion, or uh, you might see in pigmented villonodal synovitis or melanoma where the pigments actually can give rise to drop in the signal. And that's uh, probably will give some diagnostic clue what we are dealing with. Next slide, please. Nowadays, uh, we have seen that there is a shift uh, from uh, PET towards the whole body imaging. Mostly that has happened in multiple myeloma, but it is now following into the other marrow replacing lesions like lymphoma, neuroblastoma and others. So you see that uh, it is having uptake on, uh, and, and there is no uptake on the PET CT, but the marrow is entirely involved. The multiple biopsies has been done and almost uh, every uh, area is showing uh, deposits of the plasma cells. So actually it will help uh, uh, in the PET negative lesions, uh, whole body MRI is coming in a big way. Next slide, please. Uh, now we know that there is a lot of things that are happening in the limbs, uh, limb sparing surgeries. And then we want to look for, uh, when, we, when we do follow up and we try to look, there is some hesitation earlier, whether we can do an imaging, not from the safety point of view, but from imaging point of view, whether we can get a good diagnostic quality MRI, where we can identify the recurrences or there is some collection or there is some abscess formation that is happening in these areas. But both CT and MR have come up in a big way where the metal artifact reduction things is happening. And actually we will see that we can identify these collections and recurrences and abscesses very well now. Uh, next, please. Uh, other area where I think uh, the metabolic imaging will help is the uh, cartogenous lesions. So these lesions, though it is very classical for uh, osteochondroma, uh, we couldn't convince uh, our orthopedic colleague that it is only an osteochondroma. We did a pet, it doesn't show any metabolic uh, uh, uptake. And because it requires a lot of resection because it's involving rectal plexus and a uh, lot of other axillary vessels before contemplating uh, a major resection, they want to confirm that whether they are dealing with a sarcoma or a benign tumor. So it was a benign tumor, but PET will help in, uh, not in all the cases, but if it is not showing any metabolic uptake, probably it will rule out that uh, it is a high grade component. Next slide, please. So PET is also helpful uh, in identifying local regional staging and uh, the systemic metastasis, uh, especially the bone that we can get it. And also in the response assessment. In the earlier case, it is a having uh, CA and you can see that there is a complete metabolic response on the follow-up. Next slide, please. Another case where though there is a response, it is not a complete response. So there is a residual disease even after the chemotherapy. Next slide, please. So uh, with this, I would like to conclude that uh, radiographs and routine MR sequences will give you synergistic information. And if there is a doubt, you can add these additional sequences in your armentarium, and that will further help you in uh, guiding and managing your patients.
so thank you so much thank you amit uh, yeah so uh, do we have any question we have got very little time for any questions all right so all right so now i'll ask uh, dr puri sir to share his screen for a talk on what has changed as far as the surgical planning for sarcoma has concerned concerned can you see my screen mandeep yes sir just a moment So you need to make it full screen. Just a moment, please. Yes. Perfect. Now you can see it. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, thanks, Mandeep, for giving me this opportunity to speak. And uh, Mandeep, as usual, has given a very catchy title to this session: Orthopedic Oncology 2.0. What has changed in the last two decades, and what has not? He has asked me to speak on resection margins in soft tissue sarcomas. Now, when you talk of resection margins, how close can you get without it actually being life-threatening? So we all know that adequate surgical excision is the best modality for local control in sarcomas, be they bone or soft tissue. So when you have a lesion, it apparently normal healthy tissue what approach do you take do you remove as much of that unhealthy tissue to be absolutely certain that there is nothing left behind leaving back very little of healthy tissue or do you try and minimize the removal so that you have more of healthy tissue left back which obviously is going to mean better function over the years we seem to have become braver and less always seems to be better but in this minimalistic approach we need to remember are we compromising oncologic safety because we all know that in case we get positive margins at the time of surgical resection the chance of local recurrence is much higher and this is definitely a poor prognostic factor now when any king described the conventional margins he spoke of intralesional marginal wide and radical which is well known to all of us but when you talk of a safe or a wide margin what do you actually mean how many centimeters of muscle longitudinally or radially is an intact facial layer adequate when your near bone is just periosteum going to be adequate and especially when you are encountering vessels and nerves that are partially encased or very close what would you do to try and save function so this has been a problem that has been going for some time and this is a paper now more than a decade old where they asked how wide do you need to be and we thought we had clarity because the authors showed that the quantitative value didn't really make a difference whether you were less than 1 mm or more than 1 mm it did not seem to impact on local recurrence but surprisingly they themselves concluded that the extent of a margin necessary to prevent local recurrence remains unclear because they didn't have adequate numbers then in 2016 the seminal paper which spoke of the uicc classification and compared it with the classical r classification that we all use that r0 is clear margins r1 is microscopic and r2 is macroscopic but they said that only if your margin was greater than 1 mm was it r0 if it was less than 1 mm it would be r1 and they based this conclusion on the fact that in margins less than 1 mm they seem to have lesser local control than if the margin was greater than 1 mm but 2 years later this paper 
from the Toronto group with 2,200 patients contradicted them and said that whether you use the R0 or the R1 classification, the local control was same. So again, we were back to square one that less than one millimeter is greater than one millimeter. Why then do we have so much of variation among these so-called knowledgeable experts? And I think this paper published in 2011 shed some light on it, that it is the actual nature of the tumor that is causing this confusion between the less than one millimeter, greater than one millimeter concept. If the tumor is well contoured with no nodules, then even a less than one millimeter margin but if the tumor is not well contoured, has nodules, then you need more than a one millimeter margin. And this sort of explains this, that where there is a good aponeurotic plane or a fibrous pseudo capsule, then a less than one millimeter margin is adequate. But if the tumor is purely poorly contoured and has an invasive nature, then this one millimeter margin may not be adequate and should actually be classified as R1. And that could be the possible genesis for this confusion in this multiple papers that have tossed the one millimeter concept up and down. But I think a very important concept was introduced by the Japanese. And that was by Professor Kawaguchi's group, where they actually used qualitative margins rather than quantitative values. And they gave quantitative values to physical structures where a joint cartilage is equal to five centimeters, a thin barrier only two centimeters, and so on and so forth. And the Japanese are really excellent in documenting what they do. This is a post operative note that I scanned from Japan. And all their surgeries are documented like this, where the exact planes of surgery. The planes of the tumor are well documented so that they know what needs to be removed preoperatively and well document what they have actually removed compared to planning. And they showed that if you had an adequate wide margin, which is greater than two centimeters, and this is qualitative, not quantitative, then that would be adequate. Anything less than that would be inadequate. And they documented that by showing poorer local control in these so-called inadequate margins. But we as surgeons know that all of us define acceptable margins differently. What do we use to define these acceptable margins? It's a host of multiple factors. It is the type of the tumor and the grade of the tumor. For example, a lipoma or an atypical lipomatous tumor, most of us are happy to shell it out with just a thin facial covering. Sometimes even that is stripped off and really don't think too much about that. But when we are dealing with something like a myxofibrosarcoma, then we need to be a lot more careful. These are the tumors that are notable for invading facial and anatomic boundaries. They have infiltrative peripheries and therefore margins of up to three centimeters or more are encouraged to what we describe as acceptable adequate margins. And that is because most of these myxofibrosarcomas have a so-called tail. And if you don't identify that tail and actually go through it, then you're in trouble. And this recurrence-free survival graph adequately shows that how in tumors that didn't have a tail sign in myxofibrosarcoma, the local control was much better than in tumors that had a tail sign and that is why this safety of using additional quantitative values in this tumor. What is the location of the tumor also largely determines your margin. For example, tumors like this, which are stuck to bone, we all know that we will not get quantitative values. And therefore, we use the qualitative nature of the periosteum to actually make certain that we have got it out with what we would call an acceptable margin. This is a case in point, and you can see how the pathologist has documented that the anterior cut margin is actually less than one millimeter, but still tumor free. This paper shows what I've just been saying that in tumors where the periosteum is an adequate margin, then that alone is adequate. You don't need to resect the bone. The local control rates would be more or less similar. 
and the setting of bounds could mean a large amount of more functional mobility. What was the response to adjunct treatment can also determine your margins. And when we talk of adjunct treatment in soft tissue sarcomas, here we're talking of radiotherapy. In patients who are undergoing radiotherapy, either pre or post operatively, a negative margin is essential, but the quantitative width is really not important and it will not significantly influence the outcomes. These conclusions cannot be applied to tumors in which you are not going to give radiotherapy. Radiotherapy plays a large role in minimizing local recurrence and it can even decrease the incidence of local recurrences in cases where you may inadvertently have positive margins. A surgeon also uses personal preferences very often to decide on margins and this paper from the Toronto group again documents that. That when there is a critical structure that is involved or partially encased to the tumor, resetting that critical structure may not necessarily contribute vastly to better local control. Doing a marginal or a planned positive excision to just save that critical structure may actually give you equivalent margins with much better functional outcomes. But this is where the surgeon's judgment comes in and you have to decide how you are going to go about this. Patient counseling is also critical in this matter. And hopefully this sort of balance increases as you gain more experience. This paper from the oncologist just says that quantity makes no difference as long as your ink margin which you ink as being the closest margin is free of tumor, then the local control rate should not be impacted. But why are we speaking of these margins? And that is because they have an impact on local recurrence. What is the impact of these margins on local recurrence? We all know that microscopic margins will lead to increased local recurrence. But that does not mean that every get the local recurrence. In fact, about 30 to 40 percent of positive margins only get a local recurrence. It's not that every case gets one. And that is why clinical judgment is very critical. And this is where experience and surgeon sort of planning comes into play to decide where you are going to be closer than what you are comfortable with in an attempt to save function. So it's worth stressing that you don't aim for positive margin. Because in case you have a positive margin, then 45% of patients will get local decadence as compared to only 3% of patients with negative margins. But 45% means that the majority may get away without local decadence. But those who do will definitely have a poorer disease survival as can be documented both in both these graphs where local decadence led to a poorer disease survival as did positive margins. So I hope at the end of this lucid talk of mine, you have complete clarity in what your margins should be. In case you don't, don't be depressed because people wiser than you have faced this problem. This is a practice guideline that says that there have been no prospective studies that describe how wide margin should be. And no one has been able to say how many sections should be taken to assess the adequacy of excision. And this is all beautifully encapsulated in this very recent review article of 2021 that says that adequacy of margins must take into consideration both quantity and quality. And a solely positive or a negative state really gives you no insight between whether you had clear or closed margin. And the minimum margin distance necessary to reduce the risk of local recurrence still remains to be defined. So coming back to Mandeep's question of what has changed in the last two decades and what has not, this definitely has not changed. We are as unclear today as we were a decade or two decades earlier about how close we can go to this monster. But sometimes clarity is not necessarily knowledge. Clarity can also mean seeing the limitations in current knowledge. And this is an area that we are definitely limited, and at least we have clarity in the fact that we are limited. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, sir. That was an excellent talk. Uh, uh, do we have any questions? Sir, I have a question. Go ahead. Sir, uh, sometimes uh, we open up the tumor inadvertently during the surgery, the sarcoma, and then there is a contamination of the field. Now, the contamination could be a very focal contamination if it's a very solid tumor, or it could be a very widespread contamination if it was a necrotic or a mixoid tumor uh, uh, filled with a, a, a you know a liquid uh, uh, matrix. How do we um, tackle this issue? I wish I could say I know the answer, Mandi, but this is something that has to be actually taken on an individual level. I mean, we all theoretically say that we need to counsel a patient that we may need to ampute in case we cause this contamination, but we all practically know that that's a scenario that really doesn't happen in real life. So all I can say is that you have to be very controlled if you open it in a small focal area then what we do is actually take sutures in that rent in the capsule, close it off immediately and completely lavage that area. But if the contamination is really widespread and you've done things that you had not planned for, then I think you must seriously consider, depending on how aggressive the tumor is, what is the nature of the tumor, counseling the patient, actually going out, maybe talking to the relative outside and deciding to do an intraoperative amputation. If not, then post-operative radiotherapy and visiting the temple every day may help. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any question for Dr. Puri? All right. Then uh, uh, now I invite Dr. Casey Wong. Uh, Dr. Wong is, um, yes, yes. Uh, he's a very well-known figure. He doesn't really need any uh, introduction. He has been a regular uh, part of, of many of the meetings happening uh, around the globe offline as well as online. And, uh, you know, he has this keen interest and passion in uh, patient-specific implants. And he has got very deep insights into the metallurgy, the designs, the mechanics, the biomechanics. And, uh, you know, who better than him could deliver a talk on, uh, you know, what are the, what are the uh, newer developments in tumor implants? Uh, so, Dr. Casey Wong, first of all, uh, very warm welcome from IMSOS. And... Uh, 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 you know, uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, and the stage is all yours. Yeah. Please, sir. Thanks. Thanks, organizing committee to for the for the invitation. So I also thanks for the kind words. So I just want to share with uh, the story uh, behind uh, all this tumor implant development in our small uh, uh, unit in, in Hong Kong, uh, around 7.5 million uh, population. So let me share my screen first. Mm. So can you see see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes. So, so um, instead of uh, talking about all the all sorts of aspect of tumor implant, probably I just focus on the custom part because this is uh, the most controversial areas and a lot of variation and also um, uh, have a, a some sort of a, uh, mark our development uh, of this uh, uh, tumor implant in Hong Kong. So I will mainly talk about the custom implant and mainly of my stories uh, on developing this and actually, actually some of the problem, some of the mistake uh, we have uh, uh, encountered and then how we solve it. So uh, for tumor implant, uh, it is more for 40 years and initially it's a custom implant in US. And at this time, there's an induction chemotherapy, so it allowed time for the fabrication. So later on, there's uh, because of uh, uh, the, the time needed and only time for manufacturing is very inconvenient. So that's why there's an appearance of a multiple type of implants. So to start off with, when I first uh, did uh, join the Office of Oncology, it was more than 15 years ago. So uh, in Hong Kong, you now knew it initially is uh, uh, most of the tumor is done by the hand surgeons. So uh, a lot of biological uh, uh, reconstruction option was there. But when I first encountered all this, um, we think that aerograph reconstructions for some of K actually is good, but, but sometimes we 
the biology may not be able to um, uh, to address the biomechanical concern for, for all these massive bone defects. So a lot of non-union degeneration factors that we need to encounter. We, and we think that we need to have some change on this. At that time, from the very beginning, when we think of other option for prosthetic reconstruction, so one of the things at that time in the market is the rotating hinge. And then I, we think that is a, a good start to minimize the, the uh, aseptic loosening of all this implant. There have been uh, criticized for all this uh, um, disadvantage of all using all this implant. So because of the small size of our uh, Asian population, we find that uh, not Every modular implant for the hinge design is, is good for, for our, our uh, bone geometry, especially at that market at that time is only striker or stemmel. So striker, they got a more posterior located hinge areas. So because of the or small size of the knee, many of times there's a quite a bit of a patella tracking issue and some pain over the patella and the uh, fraction range is not as good as the standard one. They have a more uh, anterior uh, located posterior hinge design. So at that time, we are more favored for the standard one. And one of the things we, we find that uh, in the market uh, for striker, there's only a, a moderate implant. So of course, it's very available off the shelf implants. Uh, it's easy to, to, to make the choice to fit into your, to your pay, uh, to the patient fit in your, your available implant. Uh, they also have custom implant for, for, for stem more. So, so at that time, we are not pretty sure what, what should we do for this custom implant. We later on, because of the size issue, we, we find that, um, if we really want to uh, 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 the implant fitting to our our resection defect, we find that uh, the moderate implant actually is only fitting to our fifty percent of our cases, unless you cut every normal bone and then fit your moderate implant. And then for at that time, uh, we first start with uh, uh, if the official implant can't fit to the, the bone geometry or bone defect, we want to preserve more normal bone. And also we want to have a, a extendable procedure in pediatric case, we will uh, adopt a custom approach. So size is really an issue. So at this time, when we start with some area, there's no off-the-shelf implant like the, uh, the pelvic implant. One of the issues at that time, we are really difficult to communicate with the implant engineer. Where exactly was my bone cut? So at that time, the communication is just on the, on the 2D image uh, uh, X-ray or a screenshot of a, a, a CT scan. So you just mark like this is only 1.7 cm. So actually, it's actually, we engineer don't actually know where we want to cut, and also we are difficult to to tell them. And the next next is uh, how could we replicate the same plant cut? So this issue actually bothered us quite a bit uh, at the time of surgery, and we quite spent quite a lot of time to measure all this, and then it's still at, at that time we still have a no good answer that. So we find that at that time. Uh, more than 15 years ago, no one talked about surgery inaccuracy in replicating the pen. And then we are realizing that uh, if we really want to use a custom implant, we should solve this surgery inaccuracy. Uncertainty during the surgery, and this uncertainty actually governs the surgical margin and also the limb reconstruction with the subsequent functions. So custom implant theoretically should address the patient specific requirement. So, and then we, we should think of some method to, to address this. And at the time, I, we think that we should have uh, work on the same surgical planning platform, something like that. And also we need to some sort of assistive tools to replicate the same plant. And this two uh, area actually uh, govern our past 15 years of, um, of uh, studies, looking at how we look at this custom uh, customization in uh, spasarcoma surgeries. So from wrapping, as I mentioned that it's only 2D, so uh, the engineer and surgeon, actually, I, we don't think that we have good communication on just a 2D image. Um, so that's why later on, um, for the history of navigation, we introduced uh, some sort of the surgeon in 2002 or 2001. So we have a uh, 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 privilege to, to know more actually the sea navigation is. So at that time, we just uh, developed our first uh, uh, a case uh, using this technology to just replicate the plant, the plant, the assist to replicate the plant. 
And then later on, we find that, oh, this uh, navigation planning is the first time we can tell exactly to the endpoint engineer where exactly my resection cut, what is the geometry of that, like this joint sparing resection, what's the cartridge thickness, and then they can make an implant exactly matching to this uh, uh, resection planning. So later on, it's still difficult to have a navigation system. They are just a screenshot, not a project file they can open and manipulate. So later on, we just find that we just learn what software the engineer should use for their implant engineer. So we learn uh, the MIMEX so that we plan in the MIMEX and then send the project file to the implant engineer. And then they just uh, make a resection, uh, just make a implant that fitting to our cut. There's no any more miscommunication. But this MIMEX is not very <laughs> user-friendly and quite difficult to learn. So um, because of that, uh, because we have a lot of uh, CAT, and, uh, CAT file that need to communicate with the engineer. So at that time, uh, we work somehow work with the striker to develop the first awful map uh, 3D is a, a tumor navigation that uh, actually allowed you for a more complex type of planning import of the CAT uh, data of the implant or aerograph and then make the same resection cut. Later on, uh, engineer, they, they just put the 3D model into some sort of 3D PDF some sort of, so that you can know exactly uh, what's the shape and so on. But the, the disadvantage of this, uh, this kind of 3D PDF, you don't have anatomical CT or MI to see what's the soft tissue constraint around your implant. So I must talk about this is uh, from the implant cast. Then finally, we, we have advocated for this kind of uh, online platform for quite some years. So, so at the end, in the commercial sort of thing, the implant cast actually have a final web platform. That actually is, uh, we share the same platform to discuss the case or the implant there. And also there's a check checking function in this. So any of the uh, annotation, marking, comment, so work we on the same platform. It saves a lot of the, uh, uh, communication time and also difficulty in communication. And I think this kind of online platform actually enhance a more uh, a user to, to, to use this uh, custom type of uh, uh, design in treating our you know, tumor, tumor patient. So next is uh, the tools for replicating the plan. So you see that is all from F3D, uh, the, 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 some sort of green sort. So you, we have a exact idea where we want to make the cut, the cross section, you want to make the cut. You put your implant inside this, so you know exactly what, what's going on. And then you use a navigation to replicate the same plan. This is you replacing the cut. So we usually will put not a simple case. It's not somewhat you want to make a capsule implant, you make, want to make a very fine cut like in this patient, now he's 12 years old. Not only you can save the joint, but you save the growth of the other side. We are not realizing this in the past, but some when we did this case, many of them we are saying we are, we are just uh, too brave to do this. But this time we, we succeed that, uh, and then you find that they have a good knee function afterwards. The more bone you left, as the patient in the disease in remission, we have a more bone for any sorts of future revision uh, in the future. So later on, why we, we initially we are working for the navigation, but, but later on, seem we, we changed a bit to the 3D printing. It's because of uh, we, we have, um, uh, have some sort of a training version of the navigation. Many of the feedback showing that uh, it's quite very difficult to learn. <laughs> And also you are looking on the computer, not looking at the, at, at the, uh, at the operating field. So we have some criticism from, from some of the very senior surgeons where we are just uh, working on a computer. So as long as uh, 2009, the patent for 3D printing is expired, there's more easy access to 3D printing. So at this time, we just think that whether there's any simpler alternative, more intuitive in the resection that can be placed or, or very in case is a supplement uh, uh, for the navigation as uh, assistive tools, all this 3D printed model, cutting guide and so on. So later on, we, we just uh, have some cataphraxity to, to, to approve, uh, to, uh, to test our uh, postulation that actually it, it should be seamless accuracy. But uh, we signed that for, let's say for a uh, peripheral section for some complex cut, multiple that cut, they call a similar accuracy as compared with navigation, but with a shorter resection time. Because you put a guide and then make the cut and, and then uh, the guide platform actually control the, the direction of your saw blade. So it's much easier. 
it it actually concurred with uh, another study we we worked with uh, uh Lieutenant Paul Judith and his team uh, quite some years ago and then we find the similar finding for John's parent resection so some of the example is uh uh also sarcomas a uh, young girl um so uh, not much soft tissue component we just put a put a guy fix it with ky just to make the cut and then oh it is uh, very simple afterwards and then no need for do the registration and expose uh, exposure is just enough for the guy uh, within your surgical approach it's much easier for the surgeon and also easier to tackle the technique so uh, because the stable um, uh, reconstruction, preservation of all the cool shade, collateral, like, we allow the patient to weigh back quite, quite early. And then with the extendable implant, the pediatric actually the leg length is, is the same. So later on, we find that some of our cases, problem for uh, uh, patient-specific guide is that we are not pretty sure in some cases that we are correctly placing as planned. So at that time, uh, like uh, in, uh, in the femur, in a very small, uh, small kid, uh, they don't have a more contour surface to paste the guy, or the cut is not good for cementation putting the guy. So we think of in some very selected cases, we just uh, use the navigation to double confirm the correction, uh, the correct uh, uh, patient specific guide uh, placement. And uh, one of the good things for the patient specific guide is that uh, they call a, a cutting slot you can design so that you can control your direction and trajectory of the saw blade. So you just show it intuitively like a, a normal uh, instrument, like a total joint placement or, or total hip replacement. So um, navigation, on the other hand, the problem for navigation is that uh, is, is no need to pin the guy uh, in a physical object, but they don't have a navigate, reliable navigator saw. So we just combine the advantage of both these techniques to help in some selected case. We want to very make sure that we make the cut uh, with uh, the guide, which is played correctly as planned. So some of the case, some, some sort of this geometric cut some years ago, and then with uh, the design you work with the, your implant engineer, you can do sort of a uh, mix and match with uh, uh, some sort of modularity inside, put the plate, a different component, put a screw in whatever you think that the prime fixation is good. So another case where we think that we both technique was used because um, the, the sitting of the the in the uh, guy is not pretty sure on the proximal part and also the distal part. So we use navigation to just double check the guide the direction, a time position, and then we use the guide to make the cut. So um, we have uh, saved the the frambo head type of uh, physis, saved the other side of scapulum. We resect the greatest uh, uh, to center physis. to see some some deformed uh, growth around here, but the patient is still okay at the moment. The, for the John, for the for the John Y, we are quite pretty sure that we don't have a one failure case uh, in our series of about eighteen cases. So one of the things is that the patient be, uh, the surgeon become more capable, and then we we more capable. That means that they can put uh, in uh, more complex tumors that is more patient specific to address the, the, the concern. So the other area I want to put in aspects quite a bit of uh, uh, advancement is uh, bone junction, uh, bone implant junction uh, healing, extracortical bone bridge in growth. So I personally, I think this issue have been settled because of the appearance of XJ color and also um, the some uh, porous or erect serrated type of uh, XJ column. So if I, I want to choose, I want to choose the XJ. For porous uh, color like the strike one, men of study showing that it's only a some fibrous uh, in growth. It's not a specific bone in growth in this. So for our Asian population, because of land road bone can canal and also short remaining bone, we stress a lot of uh, this extra cortical bone bridge in growth. XJ color, whenever it's possible, prior to sleep, you can preserve coffee, with a bone graft, pediatric case, we tend to have a more custom size issue. So this is very important. For all the custom bone, the, the, the first concept is they should be uh, anatomical. But for us, um, the bone implant junction, it should be also more biological in the sense that they should have a final secondary bone fixation. But before you can achieve secondary bone fixation, you should achieve a primary bone fixation stability first. And that's the pace for the customization. You can work on your specific case 
with uh, the Pacific bone uh, defect, they can enhance the primary bone fixation. This is one of the, 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 the strategies uh, using extracortical plates. So we use a quite a lot of extracortical, whenever we think that the primary bone fixation is not good enough because of soft bone fragment, it will increase the bone rotational stability or also a good stable environment for facilitate secondary bone fixation for implant longevity. This is so important. I learned from, from this 15 year step this uh, primary bone fixation is true for, for this EBBI deformation. So just like in this case, um, uh, we shared quite uh, one or two times in, the, in some sort of conference, the uh, uh, femur sharp osteosarcoma, good chemo response. So for this so femur uh, uh, joint bone resection, we think that it is not, not an issue because the bone area contest is back, extracortical bone bay in the, in the tension side, anterior, medial, and lateral. Put a screw, actually, it's, it's really stable, and you can allow the patient to have it. It's the issue on the proximal part. This is our first case of using this to save the hip joint. In this sort of case, you can't you replace with some sort of thing without a good uh, growing femoral head. The acceptable side on the other side will have ease uh, for this particular, a lot of issues of subluxation and dislocation. So. This one we think, oh, we're very excited. Oh, we, we can put this. But we later on we find that it is not working as we think. So we break at the end. So 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 we find that the screw, actually coded screw actually is inside the bone, but it got a fractive fracture. But the issue is the problem for the prime fixation because the rotational stability of bone fixation is not good enough, and there's no groove there. So primary fixation, secondary fixation is not optimal in this case. So, but luckily we opted uh, to, uh, around two years that the bone is bigger. So we have more bone to pay around uh, so that they have a more bone fixation. So we make this design or whatever area you think that you can make a fixation except the posterior part where the blood supply to the head. So, um, and then we put the screw over on the central part instead of um, the medial part because the goal of the femoral head, we find that actually it's uh, some sort of vulgar uh, direction. And then we success successfully salvage this, 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 this leg is now 11 year, years old. So uh, we have a 10.5 cm lengthening, maximum expand, uh, exp, uh, lengthening for this implant to a good function. So looking back from our uh, before surgery and after surgery, we basically with saving both sides of the hip joint, we can save 8.5 cm femur bone and growth of the exterior and proximal tear. So lo looking back, we had a lot of time to, to plan it, but if we can save 8.5 cm, the growth of the two eyes, I think it's still worthwhile to, to to, to do it in some selected cases. So 3D printed the porous scaffold is mainly on the secondary bone uh, fixation because of the porosity, flexibility of 3D printing so that the bone is more easy to grow in. So for, for me, I think that the 3D printed, the main advantage is this uh, enhancement of secondary bone healing at the bone in conjunction because they can simulate the cancerous bone mechanical property and biological properties. So shape fixation and lactose for 3D printed implant. So one of the cases uh, with, uh, we did uh, a year ago with uh, E-Wings, um, so put a cutting guide, resection, put an implant, screw it. So all the implant engineering will work for you for the step. So it's much easier to, for you to just follow the step. Uh, of course, the tumor should not have a good uh, consolidation with chemotherapy. And that's not much a change for, for the uh, tumor extent and so on. So another uh, case for the trans cell tumor of bone with a dinosaur six month, we plan for a resection. So this is some sort of a, a manual the, uh, the, the engineer gives to you. So you just follow the, the step and then just like an instrument a manual and then you work one by one. They put all, 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 all the necessary instruments and it's just, it just looks quite, quite easy for, for our lives. So for, for making the reconstruction in selected cases. So we put a guide, drill, make, make a resection, use the follow the instruction and then put, put, put the implant on the plant in. So we have a one chapter recently uh, uh, published in one of the textbook on this. So one final thing is a uh, matter of time, someone asked, asked me uh, if you want to choose a moderate implant, uh, what, what kind of uh, brand you use? So I think this case gave us some of the insight about this because uh, DBBI not uh, good on in this, only a little bit on this. At the end, well fixed uh, stem, but uh, mechanical fractures, uh, fracture of the stem is around nine millimeter stem. So some of the uh, 
the paper or center don't allow us nine millimeters, but most of our case actually is nine or 10 millimeters only. So because of our no, no custom solution at that time for strikers. So we discuss the patient, at the end we do another revision and then put the same brand of the implant and then put a lot of bone gap, but still not a good primary fixation for secondary bone healing. So at the end, uh, strike, striker acquires stem or finally we can have a custom implant in a modular uh, setting. So the, 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 the the learning point from this case is that if you want to choose a, a modular type, it's better to choose one that has a custom solution. Otherwise, you of course, you can just do a total femur to sacrifice the hip joint, but the hip joint is very important for the function and it's also much better than, than an ordinary uh, replacement for that. So um, choose a, a modular implant date with a custom solution. So some summary of our philosophy of custom implant, off the shelf cannot address surgical uh, uh, needs. You want to be served no more mobile and then uh, advances of the two technology actually have allowed us to a more patient specific uh, uh, surgery, pelvic resection, John's uh, preserving resection, geometric type resection you want to do for your cases, you can consider this option. So this is some of the uh, working list, we we when we talk to in the with the implant engineer, you will need to make sure that for the bone geometry, mechanical function, experimental for fixation, the junctional healing, whatever method you can discuss with uh, the engineering, so whether you can address this. And then most important, all well, the communication engineer is most important for that. So is this all the step? Size, geometry, material structure. We use primary fixation. I spent a lot of time for this primary fixation to make sure that it's feasible uh, technically and also is good in the biomechanical sense. Although we don't have an objective data on this, but you need to discuss with that. And then secondary fixation for now, actually color and flip printed uh, pore selectors can, can do the job. So the workflow we published in one of our, our case report on this. So having said that, uh, our custom implant is very good, but, but this still have uh, some consideration for this because different centers have a different facility and also different patients have a vary in the biology and also respond to chemotherapy, the bone defects is also different, but there's uh, some general uh, prerequisite for consideration, there's a little time. There's a little time. If the tumor will progress within, don't, don't, don't use it. Tumor not progress low grade and then respond to chemotherapy and high risk. In the future, if this all system can, can within the two to three weeks time and then uh, that's okay. But at currently, most of custom implant need at least six to eight weeks. Two to replicate the plan resection, money is a concern your time. So I think um, because uh, we focus more on the tumor biology, the resection margin and so on, but, but we seldom talk about the patient specific like uh, the bone geometry, the sizing, the biomechanical requirement for your bone fixation and also the engineering input. So at the end, we find that we need a lot of communication with this and also industry. And that's why uh, two, two to three years ago, we have uh, this group and then I think lastly, I want to say with you uh, one um, <laughs> uh, feeling that we, we cannot solve our problem with the same thinking we use when we, we created them. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Wong. It was a great, great uh, talk. I am sure everybody uh, here is mesmerized and is uh, impressed. I'm sure there will be some questions. So, uh, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, Dr. Wong, I have a, a very practical question. Uh, see, these are all customized implants. What is their patient specific customized implants? And I'm sure it, there is no way to validate these implants. Like modular implants, they go through a channel of validation, uh, you know, where they're all tested and uh, for their. Uh, biomechanics as well as their metallurgy and uh, many of them uh, before getting the approval they go through uh, the knee simulator testing and all those things but these customized implants don't, don't undergo any validation so in a situation where you have a failure uh, you know will, will there be any medical legal issues <laughs> it's a very good question for this so i don't have a good answer for, for you to to for this but uh, theoretically Let's say which uh, company you choose for all these patient based implant. Of course, um, the only thing we can validate or regular monitor is the process of making this implant. 
is the design so all this different. So customization is really difficult to have a, some sort of a RCT type of a, a evidence based uh, 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 study for for the objective assessment of this. So we only have uh, able to have uh, some group of a uh, custom plan retrospectively know about this. The only only thing we can validate is the process of making this. So when you choose uh, which company, you better choose one bigger company. They have all the uh, track record for making the ordinary implant. They all have an ISO for all this process. Um, I'm not sure of the final uh, medical issue it will be different in different country, but if you have me to choose, I'll choose one a big company with a track record and we all going to publish a lot <laughs> so that we, we can make sure that oh this custom implant is good to use that's that's why i published in the past i yeah. need to make sure that <laughs> i Thank have you. some review on, on our work so that we are willing to uh, uh to use in our patient in the future so i think this is a, a issue need to uh, address in uh, for the futures yeah 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 uh, there is one more question for you is there a threshold for the stem length available where you would want to have an extra cortical uh, fitting? So I also asked this question to the implant engineer. So for the implant engineers, if they think that the stem is less than uh, less than uh, nine millimeters, let's say eight millimeters, seven meter, um, they tend to make uh, uh, extra cortical uh, plate uh, over the junction. So to make sure the uh, junctional healing and junctional stability and the healing is also good. For the length of ones, I think if, uh, uh, we don't have a, a, a magic number for this. Sometimes it's just a feeling. So depends on the size and also the bone structure over this, whether you use a cement or cementless stem. So whenever we think that the primary fixation is not good enough for your secondary fixation uh, with the, all the factor you are consideration, we have no hesitation to make the extra cortical plates. So otherwise, uh, you, let's say for John's bearing resection, the digital part is good, but proximal part of the shaft, it got to fail. You need to revise it. It's quite embarrassed. So for for our early case, we don't realize this. So later on, when we whenever we think that the prime fixation, especially on the sharp of this uh, John Sparrow section, we will just add an extra cortical place. For the implant engines, they were very easy to make it. So no hesitation for this. Yeah. Thank you. I think it 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 was a uh, very clear answer. All right. So I don't think there is any more question, uh, for Dr. Chang, uh, Dr. Wong. I'm I'm really thankful to you for uh, uh, giving this uh, talk and uh, spending uh, spending your Sunday morning with us. Uh, I would uh, request you to stay uh, stay with us uh, because you're going to be uh, a very important panelist for the upcoming session. I request Chetan to take us through uh, yeah. the uh, resurgence of this technique which is a, a re-implantation of tumor cellized bone. I think it is very, very pertinent to our, uh, uh, you know, demography and uh, our part of the world where, uh, you know, it is a biological yet pretty cost-effective option as compared to all these fancy implants. Yes, yeah. uh, can you hear me? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you, Mandeep, uh, for inviting me to give this talk on the implantation of sterilized tumor bone, concepts, options, and comparison. I'll quickly run through this. I think we are already behind time. So as we know, simultaneous progress in imaging technology, medical oncology, and joint replacement surgery changed the scene for patients with bone sarcomas in the 70s and 80s. That was the dawn of the era of limb salvage surgery for bone tumors, which was amply aided by the development of mega endoprocesses which gave immediate functional and cosmetic outcome with uh, mega process, which was unmatched by any other limb saving procedure. And therefore, majority of the long bones were easily managed with mega prosthetic replacement. However, as survival improved, the limitations of the mega process has become evident. Most of these patients with bone tumors are young and they have a active and demanding lifestyle. And although there were high quality implants, they still fail relatively early. This could be in the form of wear and subsequent losing of the moving components, fatigue failure of the metallic component with deformation and breakage, or there could be aseptic, septic losing, periprosthetic fracture, etc. So to prolong the life of the implant, we have to advise this patient to limit their physical activity to essential needs, which is certainly not desirable. So if there is a young patient who is a survivor, he is very likely to need multiple revision procedures throughout life in case he has been treated with the mega processes. 
So this has forced a relook at biological options of reconstruction following dissection of a bone tumor. A biological reconstruction, if it works, has clear advantages over any artificial implant as far as the longevity is concerned. Moreover, if the natural joint could be preserved, the functional outcome would be clearly superior to that possible with an artificial joint. Well, a search of literature reveals that some of these methods have been published as case reports several decades ago, long before the advent of megaprocesses. However, those are the dark ages as far as limb salvage for primary bone sarcomas were concerned. Only the very brave or the extremely foolish would really attempt limb salvage for patients with bone sarcoma. Well, I was searching for literature when I came up with uh, this case report, which was a follow-up case of chondrosarcoma that was reported in 1969. This was a 19-year follow-up of a 21-year-old lady with proximal femur chondrosarcoma treated in 1949, treated with resection of bone, autoclaving of the specimen and reimplantation, who was alive and ambulant at 19 years. The X-ray in this, uh, you know, uh, PDF uh, picture that we see on the left is her tumor X-ray, and on the right is at the time of this reporting, where she has got a nicely fused hip, and the fixation, if you see, was done with a single screw. Similarly, extracorporeal radiotherapy was first reported in an Israeli medical journal by Sipra and Lubin. More than half a century ago in 1968, they reported on their experience with two cases. Since then, sporadic and scanty reports of reimplantation of sterilized bone tumor has popped up in literature. However, it was only in the late 90s, after the initial excitement of megaprocesses bore away, there was a renewed interest in these biological reconstruction options. Since then, many studies and novel techniques of reimplantation of sterilized tumor bone has been described. Today, in well-selected cases of primary bone sarcomas, this would be considered as a procedure of choice. These techniques have been most successful in diaphyseal primary bone sarcomas of the long bones, allowing preservation of the natural joint at both ends. When done well in properly selected cases, the oncologic and functional outcome is excellent and patient can be restored to almost near normal function. However, when these techniques are applied to osteoarticular resection and reimplantation, with some exceptions, the, research, the results have been sort of disappointing. This is a patient with Ewing sarcoma of the proximal tibia, just to illustrate you know, where this kind of technique is useful, who has a lesion in the proximal metadiaphysis, which is quite away from the joint, as we can see in these MRI images. So when you plan this patient the resection, even if you give a margin of two centimeters proximally, you still have two centimeters of the bone left. So that is the disease in pink. These green bands are the margins. And when you resect, that is the defect that you are left with. So yes, in this case, we can definitely preserve the joint uh, and you know still achieve a wide excision. Now the issue is about reconstruction. So after an intercalary wide excision for meaningful and functional limb salvage, structural integrity of the bone has to be restored. The, we have to fill the gap in the bone with some material which will bridge the space between the two separated fragments of bone, restoring the bone to its necessary form and function. The only thing that will fit this gap perfectly is a segment of bone that was removed. So to put it back, we have to first ensure that the disease in it is dead while preserving the form and structural strength of the bone. So the prerequisites for a successful reconstruction of this nature is that the disease should be diaphyseal, the articular end should be sufficiently spared after a wide excision with adequate margins. The disease segment should have structurally strong bone which is not fractured or at any risk of fracture. And we should also uh, be able to securely fix this piece of bone back into the defect using appropriate implants. So for that we need to do some form of sterilization of the tumor bone. There are various methods that have been described. The four common ones are autoclaving, pasteurization, extracorporeal radiotherapy, and the new kid on the block that is cryotherapy. Some of some uh, doctors have tried autoclaving of the resected tumor bearing bone to kill the tumor cells. Here, the wide excision of tumor bearing segment is done, following which this tumor bearing bone is heated in an autoclave at 120 degrees for 10 minutes. Then the soft tissue is all scraped off the bone and the specimen is cleaned and re-implanted. However, this has, you know, 
a lot of disadvantages of this autoclave bone graft one is the osteoinductive property of the autograft is lost only the osteoconduction is preserved it takes a long time for this dead bone to revascularize and unite the autoclave bone is brittle so it is structurally weak and there has been significant number of uh, cases where there was graft resorption or fracture of the graft kata et al have reported on 12 cases uh, with a mean union time of more than 2 years and an infection rate of almost 42% van et al on the other hand studied 10 cases and reported rates of non union of 30% the infection of 20% and fracture 20% so there is a significant complication rate with this procedure next uh, due to the problems with high temperature sterilization and autoclaving a low temperature heating procedure was developed which is called as pasteurization so here urist et al have observed that in heat treatment with temperature greater than 70 degrees the biologic activity of bmp is completely destroyed so here the resected tumor segment is heated at a lower temperature of 60 degrees but for a longer time of 30 minutes so it has been proven that this is enough to kill all the tumor cells in the tumor bearing bone so it kills all these cells while at the same time it preserves the mechanical strength and osteoinductive property of the graft so in that sense pasteurization is considered superior to autoclaving however it is also plagued with the same set of problems as the autoclave bone which is infection non union fracture and bone resorption john et al have reported on 21 cases where they shown rates of deep infection of 14% bone union non union of almost 24% and fracture of about almost 10% of these implanted bones han et al have reported on 13 cases with an infection rate of 15% non union rate of 42% and a fracture rate of 23%. So here too there is a significant uh, complication rate. So following heat treatment of the tumor bearing bone the structural strength of strength of the bone is reduced and there is an increased risk of complication like non union graft resorption fracture and higher risk of infection. So to increase the chance of success with these procedures it has been found that it is helpful to combine it with a vascularized fibula graft to have a composite graft here the benefit is that there is additional strength to your reconstruct at the same time there is a live graft which will integrate and unite faster and it will likely take over the graft before the graft fails due to any reason now this extra corporeal radius irradiation of the autograft was first described by spira and lubain in 1968 as we already seen for the management of bone sarcoma here the resected bone is devitalized with 50 grays of radiation in a single shot which is lethal to all living tissue so the entire tumor bearing bone is killed making it safe for implantation with suitable devices some surgeons have also augmented this with vascularized fibula graft for better and early union however other studies have recommended that you can fill this medullary canal of the irradiated bone with bone cement to improve the mechanical strength of the bone graft dr ajay puri et al in jso 2018 have reported on 70 cases of intercalary ecrt in which 91% of the metaphyseal osteotomy united versus 71% of the diaphyseal osteotomy there was soft tissue recurrence in about 10% of cases and a five year survival of the graft of almost 80% so this is the same case that i have shown earlier a patient with living sarcoma of the proximal tibia metadiaphyseal region where after this resection of this 17 cm segment of metadiaphysis this specimen was then sent for extra corporeal radiotherapy it was then got back to the theater where all the soft tissue was stripped off the canal was reamed and packed with cement and the bone was reimplanted a gastrocnemius muscle flap was used to cover the bone and that was the x ray at the end of fixation at 3 months 6 months and at 2 and 1/2 years it has united this is his x ray at 5 years and that is his uh, function quite recently that was about 6 months ago he followed up with me So we got excellent range of knee movements, and he is an independent walker. 
so this is a permanent solution for him hopefully you will not need any form of revision as you would otherwise face with the mega processes now the recently the trend is for extra corporeal frozen autograph this was first developed in 1999 in japan by yamamoto at all here freezing with liquid nitrogen destroys the tumor cells by ice crystal formation and cell dehydration also it can cause thrombosis of the microcirculation leading to ischemic impact of the tumor cells so what are the steps here the tumor bearing segment is frozen with liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees for 20 minutes after that it is thawed at room temperature for 15 minutes and finally it is rinsed with distilled water for 10 to 15 minutes the advantages are significant the austrian diction and austro conduction properties are well preserved the biomechanical strength remains unaffected it does not require any augmentation with vascularized fibula graft therefore there is early revitalization of the graft the freezing procedure requires less equipment than any other recycling technique and does not need any special facility and it is very cost effective we can do this procedure in two ways one is a standard freezing procedure where extra corporeal freezing of the resected tumor bearing bone segment is done in liquid nitrogen followed by reimplantation where in which suchi et al had reported on 28 patients in 2005 there are complications in 9 patients infection in 11% fracture in 7% soft tissue recurrence in 7% non union in 7% of cases they also described a modification of this procedure where in well selected cases pedicle freezing procedure is done where the tumor bearing bone is dipped in liquid nitrogen while still attached to the healthy host at one of its ends Suchi et al again has reported on 33 cases of pedicle freezing in 2010 with a complication in 12 cases infection of 13% fracture in 10% soft tissue local recurrence in 10% non union in 7% all of them were managed successfully so this pedicle freezing is a unique procedure which is only possible with liquid nitrogen it helps avoid the diaphyseal osteotomy which is where most of the non unions occur in these kind of procedures This is a patient with parosteal osteosarcoma of distal femur where I could do this kind of uh, extracorporeal cryotherapy. That is his MRI image and CT scan here on the lower right. So based on the planning, 16 centimeters of the bone was resected, preserving two centimeters of the distal end. It was then dipped in liquid nitrogen for 20 minutes. following which it was thawed and dipped in distilled water for 20 minutes then it was stripped of all the soft tissue and reimplanted that is his post op x ray at 12 months and this is his most recent x ray at 18 months it, it took a long time to show you know attempt that union and i think now it is on its way to union there are certain special applications of reimplantation of sterilized tumor bone People have tried osteoarticular resection of tumor bearing bone and reconstruction after extra corporeal sterilization. It has not been very successful in the large bones of the knee. They develop osteoarthritis, bone desorption, etc. It is certainly not to be considered in the proximal femur and proximal humerus. They collapse, go into avascular necrosis. However, some promising early results in pelvic tumor resections involving acetabulum and proximal ulna has been reported. such procedures are compatible only with ecrt we cannot do this procedure with cryotherapy or with uh, autoclaving or pasteurization in all of the other procedures of tumor sterilization the cartilage gets physically damaged gundawada et al have reported in 2020 of 19 cases of osteoarticular ecrt in which 16 pelvises with acetabulum and three proximal ulna were uh, managed in this procedure with a minimum 2 year, years follow up all three elbows have 100% function in the pelvis they had one infection and avascular necrosis of the femoral head in two and joint space narrowing in one of the cases osteoarticular resection and reconstruction with resurfacing of the joint or joint replacement can also be done generally this is done in the proximal femur and proximal humerus especially in cases where their bone is needed for anchorage of the implant and muscle attachment for function So to conclude, in well-selected cases, extracorporeal tumor bone sterilization and reimplantation is a very good procedure in the surgical management of primary bone sarcoma. This procedure is best suited for diaphyseal bone tumors. Outcome in osteoarticular tumor bone is varied. 
it shows early promise in the pelvis and proximal ulna of the different methods of tumor bone sterilization available ecrt is the most widely used and has relatively consistent outcome in various hands cryotherapy holds a lot of promise as an equally effective way of tumor bone sterilization and also gives the option of pedicle sterilization of tumor bone it is also very cost effective and does not need a specialist center for using it however one must know that liquid nitrogen can be dangerous and it has to be handled with care due to higher complication rate autoclaving and pasteurization are not considered as a modality of choice for tumor bone sterilization however if you are still compelled to do it it will be advisable to use a vascularized fibular graft along with it thank you thank you chetan it was a very lucid talk uh, yeah. there is a question for you uh, yes please is it better to strip off all the soft tissues before sending the specimen for ecrt or uh, yeah. see uh, it honestly doesn't matter whether you strip it off before or after i prefer to do it after because uh, once it is sterilized i am dealing with dead tissue so i am not too worried about contamination uh-huh. otherwise in the operation theater i will have to isolate myself in a corner really you know see to it that all those instruments that i use you know don't come back to the trolley that becomes a bit tedious sometimes not that you cannot do mm-hmm. so my personal choice is to you know send it down first get it sterilized and then bring it back and do whatever you want with it okay. thank you chetan do we have any other question sir jagandeep here sir yes please go ahead yes sir uh... prior sending to uh, the bone for the radiation or for the sterilization yes uh, would it be beneficial that we get some histopathological inputs uh, which will help in the adjuvant treatment uh, because in the irradiated tissue in any case we will not get any histopathological inputs that's true see the point is we do send marrow margin you know whenever we do this kind of segmental resection especially when you are attempting it as a close margin sometimes Yes. The other thing that we do is whatever soft tissue we strip off, we send that to the pathologist for an assessment. I agree that it will not give you a complete picture, but it is something better than nothing. As such, even if you get a report of you know twenty percent necrosis or hundred percent necrosis, it's not really going to change your plan of management for this particular patient. Thanks. thank you chetan uh, so there is one more question uh, for pedicle cryofreezing is it mandatory to make drill holes yes otherwise uh, you know this this is basically a uh, you know uh, very cold uh, liquid but it instantly turns into gas when you know it is heated up and that can cause fractures in the bone it can even cause embolism so it is you it is mandatory to do the drill hole drill hole yes yeah. all right chai chetan thank you very much i think we are running really uh, behind the time schedule we'll start yes. with the cases uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, esteemed panelists uh, chetan dr manish pruthi dr kc wong dr akshay tiwari and i believe everyone who is present can certainly participate uh, uh, in this panel discussion uh let us keep it very informal we are um, uh, hardly 30 35 people in uh, in this uh, zoom meeting so let us keep it pretty informal but let us try and finish every case in 15 minutes the first case will be presented by dr uh, dr chinder who is uh, from bangalore uh, hcg and uh, 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 pramod i would request you to finish off the case presentation in next first 2 to 3 minutes Okay. and then do the discussion for next 8 minutes and okay. then next 3 to 4 minutes you can show the outcome of the patient what you did and what was the outcome of the patient so uh, no discussion over the diagnosis no discussion over whether limb salvage or amputation we know that it, this underwent limb salvage surgery and then you can just stop at the reconstruction part okay, okay. and then ask what reconstruction would you do something like that so, so what i have done is what i have done is i have made a video of the whole thing so that we will make it compact okay i'll pause it Uh, yeah you you pause yeah. it uh, at the time of uh, of the discussion uh, 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 with the panelists yeah please please start your video yeah uh, share screen
just a second. Pramod, is there any problem? Dr. Pramod? Yeah. I... Uh, if, if there is any problem, we can ask uh, the next presenter to start with uh, his presentation and we can take Pramod's case later on. Pramod? I think uh, you can do that. I can't see promote the uh, here. Oh, can is you it? See him? No, I can't. Um, so, Pratik, are you ready with your case? Uh, yes, sir. I can. Yeah, Pratik, that. you just start off. No problem. Okay. Uh, so, let me just share my screen. Oh, Pramod is back. Okay. No problem. Pramod will take your case later on. Yeah. Since we couldn't see you, we have asked uh, um, Pratik to start with this case. So, next okay. will be your case. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, shall I start, sir? Yes, yes, please. Uh, greetings to all. And uh, first of all, thank you to IMSOS and to Mandeep, sir, for giving us this opportunity to present this case. Uh, sir had approached uh, Mishra a week ago to uh, present this talk, but unfortunately, he couldn't be there, so he has asked me to do the honors. And so I immediately called up Mandeep, sir, as to Karna kya hai, sir. So he told me, you just have to present the case and you don't have to give a talk per se. So I will not pitch most of the time and uh, we just move on to the case. So just a brief history, it was a 24 year old male student came with a history of high grade sarcoma of the right thigh, operated with wide local excision and post-op radiotherapy around two years back. Then when he was on follow-up for that, he developed a recurrent swelling which was just outside the field of the radiation. Again, he underwent wide local excision and again post-op radiation. Now on follow-up for that, he experienced pain in the left hip. So now what is important here is that the pain is now on the opposite side from where he presented. So he got a radiograph done and this is how he presented. So you see a pelvis x-ray and you see an erosion in the supraacetabular part. So now we went ahead and got some MRI done and this MRI shows that that soft tissue erosion is into the bone and you can see it in the acetabulum it is going up in what would have been probably the triradiate cartilage in young children. And superiorly, the edema is going up to the anterior superior iliac spine. In the other views, that is the axial view also, we see that uh, the sacroiliac joint is preserved, the ischium is preserved, but it is the anterior part of the acetabulum which is majorly involved. A sagittal view gives us a better idea of the orientation. Here you can see the femoral head and you can see how the disease has eroded from outside in and the posterior acetabulum is preserved but the superior and the anterior one is destroyed so basically we had this imaging ceremony uh, summary where there was erosion and it was involving so now uh, we had to go ahead and do a resection and a reconstruction so what i would like to ask the panelists are the options of reconstruction and since we have such a wide uh, esteemed panel representing the various institutes in India, let's start with uh, from the north. Let's start with Dr. Akshay Tiwari, if he's there, as to how we would have approached the case. I think uh, one, uh, what is your plan of re resection? Is it going to be an extra articular hip resection or intra articular hip resection? So I thought okay. I will uh, discuss that with the panelists and then show what okay. we did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Akshay, are you there? Okay, Akshay. Otherwise, uh, if Dr. Chetan Anshan can take this. Yes, Chetan. Yeah, so this is a metastasis of... Uh, sir, it, it, is, uh, it is a metastasis from the high-grade sarcoma of the opposite side. Okay, solitary metastasis. But solitary, okay, yes. We did a staging for him and uh, it showed that this was the only site of presentation at that time. Uh, okay. 
Pratik, go back to the, the go to the previous slide so that people can yes you know, yeah is this okay? comment on the resection part. Right. No, no, the, the, that one was good. That one was good. Okay. Yeah. So, is this what kind of uh, you know sarcoma was this? So they had reported it as high grade sarcoma. They yeah. could not differentiate it further. They said that it is high grade, and huh. uh, that's when we decided that we have to anyways go ahead and resect it. Now the discussion uh, say that we had with ourselves and with the patient was what would be the reconstruction or how would we go about our re resection for this? Okay. The first thing we have to you know make it clear to him that this is very likely to be a palliative situation. Because the fact that this is, you know, a extra pulmonary metastasis in a sarcoma yeah. with a poor, you know, prognosis. So, primarily in this situation, I would really think, you know, uh, whether I should really operate and do such a major radical resection in a, you know, patient with a pelvic metastasis of, a, you know, sarcoma. So, I would definitely discuss with him, counsel him regarding, you know, the outcomes. Depends on how symptomatic he is, how painful he is. I may even try, you know, palliative radiotherapy before I consider, you know, any sort of surgical treatment uh, for him. Maybe even discuss with the medical oncologist regarding the role of chemotherapy. So but if at all, huh, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. So, so if so at all discuss... you have to resect it, uh, you, yeah. if at all you have to resect it, then let us if come If at here. all, yeah, yeah, I have to resect it. I will do an intra-articular, you know, resection uh, of the acetabulum, do a you know, type 2 plus 1 sort of uh, resection of the acetabulum. And I will reconstruct it with a mesh, nothing more. Okay. Dr. Dr. Casey Wong is around, so we can take his opinion. Yes. Uh, I, I suppose the patient have low lung metastasis. It's no, only no. The, so um, for, for me, if I treat it in my unit, I I will be with the first histology. If necessary, I will get another biopsy to to because normally for bone metastasis in, in soft sarcomas, many of the time they seldom skip the, the lung metastasis and then got a big uh, bone metastasis. So I start a bit of uh, the, the the histology part. So if necessary in the empty meeting, we will probably get another biopsy for that. So, um, and then if we think there is a bone sarcomas, something like that, an input from the medical oncology may have a role. Yeah. So for, let's say for a resection for this, I'm, it's quite um, the, the P1 need to be resected. The yeah. P2 also need to be resected. So in the setting of the possible uh, metastatic ones, so I will have no reconstruction for this. Okay. So um, extra articular resection, P1, P2, and then some sort of mesh, uh, no reconstruction, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I think. Uh, those Do we are have any two. other opinion from from Dr. Manish? Pruthi is around. Manish, uh, yeah. if if you have to resect it, let's let's come there. You have to resect this region. Let's not get into the oncological part. Then would you be doing an extra articular or intra articular resection? What will be your reconstruction method? Well, I think we have to go into the oncological part because I am not very convinced in resecting this. Okay, I, I also want to use uh, some divided therapy and reconfirming the histology. But let's say, uh, like, let's forget the previous history. Let's say this is a primary sarcoma in this area with no previous history. Then also, if I'm resecting this, I will not do the reconstruction. And we have we are done. We have a very good results for using a poly mesh, a mesh the Okay. Okay. So if, if this is the only sarcoma, then definitely I think of a resection. But with the previous history, with one year DFI. I would like to reconfirm the histology, get a proper histological diagnosis, maybe use some new adjuvant therapy and see how the patient is responding to new adjuvant before taking a follow-up dissection. Okay. But so my my argument is let us all uh, we are all we all say that uh, this patient has a poor likely to be have a, having a poor prognosis, and yeah. if he has to if he has maybe one year, two years, maybe three years to survive, why not to give yeah. him something more functional as a reconstruction? So that he can work on the next day of surgery. And if, uh, with a pelvic resection, where you're doing a mesh plus, he's not going to be functional for the next six to eight okay. months at least. That's what I'm saying. So why not to give him something which is which will allow him to walk on the next day? Something like a pelvic prosthesis. Something like a pelvic prosthesis. Give, give, give SBRT and do uh, a 
ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಡಬಲ್ ಓ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಹಿ ವಿಲ್ ವಾಕ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ಅ ಶಾರ್ಟ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟೆನ್ಸಿ ದಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಡು ಮಚ್ ಬೆಟರ್ ದನ್ ದ ಸೆಟಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಲ್ವಿಸ್ ಐ ಅಗ್ರಿ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೈ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೈ ಪರ್ಸೆಪ್ಷನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಅ ಒನ್ ಇಯರ್ ಡಿ ಎಫ್ ಐ ಹೈ ಗ್ರೇಡ್ ಸಾರ್ಕೋಮಾ ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ರೆಕಾರ್ಡ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಸೀ ದ ಆಂಕೋಲಜಿಕಲ್ ಔಟ್ ಸೊ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ವಿ ಕನ್ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಎಸ್ಪಾಲಜಿ ಹೈ ಗ್ರೇಡ್ ಸಾರ್ಕೋಮಾ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಗೋ ಟು ಅ ಬೆಟರ್ ಪೆಥಾಲಜಿ ಡೂ ಸಮ್ ಮಾಲಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಗೆಟ್ ಅ ಬೆಟರ್ ಇಸ್ಟಾಲಜಿ and give a new adjunct chemotherapy see the response to the treatment and then accordingly plan your treatment i have felt these sections are morbid even if we say it we will be 100% there is a 1% mortality also involved with the pelvic section so i will do only if i am curative okay sure okay. pratik so, i think uh, we can go ahead what did you yes sir so actually what was uh, the logic the and point, science behind it yeah so the point that you raised ki uh, we don't know how much is the uh, outcome or survival of this patient so might as well give the good uh, functional outcome is what his parents and his relatives also raised so the things that we discussed with them is the young age of the patient an active lifestyle wanted a minimal limb length discrepancy post surgery uh, but the discussion that we had mainly was on the disease biology as our panelists here have discussed he uh, there is a history of it having come twice now in two years uh, but uh, uh, the point in favor of going ahead with a, a curative intent was that it still was uh, not having a pulmonary matter and it this was the only site of a metastasis if metastasis that is there so we had a talk with the medical oncologists also and the radiation oncologist also the radiation oncologist was the same one who had given radiation on the other side also so uh, they agreed we, we went ahead with neo adjuvant chemotherapy while we were planning what is to be done so we went through a few literature and uh, we found this where they have uh, the, the group from beijing china where they have reconstructed with 3d printed pelvic and also kc wong sir's uh, paper where he has step wise described how to go about this surgery so we decided let us at least get a 3d reconstruction done so that we can explain to the patient also as to what we are looking at if we go ahead with a surgery and compared to not going ahead with a reconstruction and doing only a mesh plasty so this is what we had presented with and if we go ahead and excise so this is what we are looking at and if we have to fill that defect then uh, this is what something uh, it would look like and uh, final picture would be somewhat like this the advantage is being that he would be mobilized from the next day he can walk he will have uh, functional independence uh, versus it being a metastatic setting and uh, you know whether it is worth doing all this so there was a lengthy discussion in all this and thankfully we had time because he was on chemotherapy uh, so the patient uh in knowing all the risks and benefits insisted that we go ahead with a reconstruction with a modality which will give him a theoretically long term benefit if suppose he survives this so we started planning for the pd reconstruction one and we got patient specific jigs made and on a uh, model and this is how the 3d printed model and the 3d printed uh, implant looked like so what actually happened was we did the resection and uh, we uh, this is the use of the jig to place the implant and uh, this is uh, you can see if your orientation the on the right hand side is the head end of the body on the upper side is the medial end you can see the implant we have covered that with a mesh to hold it in place because we had to resect the femoral head because now because there is a titanium implant we had to put in a uh, poly liner and uh, we had to do a ceramic uh, femoral head replacement and that is how the implant was and this was uh, how the patient uh, was a few weeks uh, two months after the surgery he was walking and uh, there was weakness on both sides and uh, but he was still able to walk and he was Uh, able to sit go go to college do his work so he was uh, doing okay but unfortunately he developed a lung mets few months later after this video was taken medical oncologist has now started in on second line chemotherapy 
it's now 10 months post surgery uh, the implant is doing okay but unfortunately the patient is not so what are the learnings from this case that we have is uh, discuss the options available with the patient relatives the pros and cons of all the options available irrespective of what reconstruction you do achieving a tumor free margin still remains the most important thing uh resection becomes a challenge if you don't have navigation in this because you have to use this patient specific jigs if you see this uh, photo that i have placed this jig actually sits on the ischial tuberosity so we ended uh, we end up actually uh, dissecting more than what we would if it was only a pure uh, resection and that was one challenge that we had during the surgery uh this was a uh, this is a promising reconstruction method but this we have only an experience of a single case and probably uh, not the most ideal case to do this on uh, at the end what we realize that the intent of surgery the planning of the surgery and the execution of the surgery are on one side and what the outcome that you get at the other end is a different thing and uh, as the topic uh, that was given to me when in doubt i think it's uh, best to do the mesh plasty because it has been proven to give good results functional results also except for that uh, limb length discrepancy that the patient may have uh, but otherwise uh, oncologically and functionally it has been known to give good results thank you thank you prateek um uh, right so do we maybe we can have a uh, have a small comment from one of the panelists maybe uh, chetan can make a comment i don't see uh, yogesh is not around yet chetan you can make a small comment on what you feel about this case uh, and then we can uh, go on to pramod's case here see okay see if the patient is willing and you know affording and you know if he wants to exercise his option this is not a bad case to you know start off <laughs> you know uh, yeah. an experience with you know because if it fails at least it fails in someone who is anyway failing so you know but otherwise i think very well done you know brave of you to actually do that and you know actually execute it uh, no doubt and uh, definitely it is an option i mean we cannot deny that 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 is an option only thing is we are very comfortable with mesh plasty very predictable you know recovery is you know sort of you have no headaches basically after surgery that is the whole point Okay. But good, good. Thanks, Pradeep. Pradeep. Excellent case. Pradeep, can I come in? Yes, okay, sir. Yogesh, you're around. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah I'm yes, here. Sir. I'm here. Yeah, I was here, uh, okay. listening to all the discussions. See, I feel that you know, almost a near equal good result can be obtained by mesh plasty with such a patient with such a situation. Uh, when we know that the DFI is extremely uh, small, and we have doubts about the longevity of the patient himself, I would have opted for the mesh plasty straight away. I mean, this is an option. Agreed. but then if it had to be our own relative what would we do is the question to be asked the actually uh, the first option that we gave because we have also been trained in mesh plasty so was mesh plasty and uh, the patient then went home discussed uh, relatives and then came back and asked is there something else that can be done like we are ready to try so the other option that we discussed was uh, ecrt and uh, doing a reconstruction with that or uh, this option was given as to like these are available but uh, obviously the first option that we had given was mesh plasty because uh, we have good experience with that and we have seen good results with that uh, but uh, yeah i agree i agree mesh plasty would have given the only no, major I mean, concern let's Yeah. let's let's discuss this the other way around just i'll take a minute, half a minute or so sure, sir. Yeah. had had your patient had a fantastic result let's assume that your patient patient had a fantastic fantastic result he has got no metastasis 2 years 3 years down the line so let's suppose that that's a situation yeah. Yeah. i agreed that this is one of the pelvic processes one of the options but in a in a routine normal given case would you still offer a pelvic processes or would you not, do a mesh plasty not as the first option This uh, okay. mesh plasty right. would always be the first option that we give. Uh, you know, the, why don't you set up your uh, case while we discuss this? Yeah, already, already. Yeah. So the mesh plasty right, always it, it is only this discussion comes uh, honestly, sir, when the patient asks, "Are there other options that can be tried?" 
So uh, I feel that's, it's that's exactly because ultimately yeah. that's that's the point I'm coming to. Yeah. Ultimately, you have to take a decision for yeah. the patient sometimes. True. Not in all True. cases the patient will yeah. give his or her option to you. Yeah. So you know when when that happens, should we rather put our foot forward and say that no no you go for a mesh plastic? That's my point actually. I think you are obligated to give Bro. the options you guys to patients. I think you are obligated to give options and discuss plus and minus and then let them decide. Absolutely, I am not saying that you don't give options. Yeah. I am saying when the patient asks you to choose between yes, the two, so then you, you always say that my my yeah. preference is mesh plastic, but these exactly. are the options. Yeah, right. yeah, right. Yeah. If, right. If, uh, right. Given a choice, we would have done mesh plastic any day because uh, that is what we prefer. That is what we do, and uh, but in this case, the discussion arose because. Uh, we were exploring other options okay, i was in a particular before, thanks, before, before, thanks a lot yeah. uh, so Thank just, you. i just Thank had you. one doubt to ask to kc wong sir actually so if i can yeah uh, i'm not realize you actually you uh, you can be so quite a size sizable part of the ileum so uh, if uh, we can save a bit of the ileum uh, definitely a prosthesis can be one of the choice but given that uh, the lead time in manufacturing uh, unless you give chemotherapy to consolidate that bit of the tumor uh, otherwise is uh, custom implant may not be an option because of the lead time the technical yeah. aspect yeah. whether you we should compete the pelvic ring for for uh, reconstruction um let's say for this case we, we quite a bit of doubt about the prognosis of this patient so to make it simple i just uh, make the fixation over the island part and skip the two part on on the uh, pubic part and also is to porosity because that resection is quite a uh, uh, a lot of soft tissue constraint yes. to putting a guide. Yeah. So, uh, and there also there's no evidence that uh, competing the ring um, is a better option. Okay. So one of the fixation for item, I would suggest um, we all the bone transfer from the spine to the pelvis is over the PSIS region. The, the posterior part of the ileum part. So you need a strong fixation, no matter screw or stem, you crossing about this so that they can transfer the uh, force from the spine to the pelvis. So from the your implant, you only have some some plate over the lateral side. They may not be serving the purpose for sharing the stress. There's some of the comment on the design part. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Pramod. Hey, hey Mandeep, you can hear and see the screen. Yes, 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 absolutely, yes. So, hi everybody, and uh, it's a great uh, Sunday morning. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, when uh, uh, one of the cases what uh, Mandeep found it interesting, so I thought we'll discuss about this case. So, I'll just go through a small video so that uh, you guys, I'll pause it whenever needed. So, this guy is, uh, when we operated, he was a nine-year-old, a ten-year-old boy with a conventional osteosarcoma of the proximal tibia, non-metastatic. Okay, so uh, I mean the standard chemotherapy, MAP regimen, uh, two cycles done and uh, doing very well, pain decreased significantly and is uh, all well. So we started, uh, can you see the video? Yeah, so this is the X-ray, fine uh, X-ray, MRI and uh, the proxa pictures. So what, uh, I think I'll stop here. So any uh, thoughts on the reconstruction part at this age, 10 year old boy with a standard neurogen non-metastatic case in proximal tibia? Now, uh, so we all thought that, uh, I mean, I think everyone will say that this is an osteoarticular, straightforward osteoarticular proximal tibia section. Yeah. But now Dr. Wong is around and he might have different opinion. He might be uh, wanting to stay with the joint. Uh, yeah. Is the epiphysis morph? No, no, it's not. The epiphysis, proximal tibia epiphysis, it was involved for this case? No, no it's yes. not involved. No, no, no. Epiphysis. No. Then, then you try epiphysis resection with a prosthesis. Yeah, yes, the, yeah. It's, uh, it's just sacrificing the joint. You have a lot of problem of uh, dealing with joint stability. If you got an implant that passed to the other side of the distal femur, they jeopardize your growth. So, by all means, if the patient clinically be uh, of chemotherapy is well consolidated, uh, for for me, I'll just do a intra epiphysis resection and then a custom extendable implant for 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 him. Custom expandable prosthesis. So, 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 so Wong, you, will, it, yeah, yeah. you will save the joint? Yes. Okay. Yeah, for the tibia part, for yeah. the tibia part, the issue is the blood supply for this small piece of bone is not an issue. But for distal femur, 
um, I haven't had time to show that we must preserve uh, the middle genicular artery that's supplying the distal femur epiphysis. For proximal TV, there's a lot of blood supply from the cruciate ligament. So it's no problem for, for, for the uh, blood supply for this remaining small piece of the bone. Okay. Can I also comment? Yes, yes, Dr. Putri. So, yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Hong. Like, I will also do an intra epithelial section here. But uh, because the custom made implants are a little costlier in this part of the world, what I'll do is I'll do a uh, recycling of the tumor, either ECRT or cryo, and put it back and see the place. We have done that and it, it does very good. So, we can easily do under a even under a CM, we can do a resection just above the physis, save a small fragment and recycle it. Yeah. That can give a good. Yeah. So, okay. the, the question. Yeah, Steve, uh, can I come in just a second? Yes, yes actually, oh, you are around. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. see, there, as, as uh, Dr. Wong said, one is the vascular supply, and the other difference that proximal tibia gives us uh, in comparison with the distal femur is that it's flat. So it lends itself to very good fixation. It's a flat surface and uh, even a very thin bone. And in fact, it's not as thin as it appears because there is also cartilage there. It gives us some bone stock for fixation. Even two lakh screws crossing give us a very robust fixation uh, in a young child when you are, we are using a, a recycled bone here. So I would also go for an intercalary here yeah, as far as wow. the uh, images go. Yeah. Is Canada's an option here? Canada's technique? Manish, uh, you have done a, a patient with candle sac, you know, at TMH, you do candles for some patients. Do you we, think candles is an option here? Candle is, is always an option, but, but putting a sand screw before surgery, I always worry about infection. So putting a sand screw and then converting it to a yes. plate. So candle has a technically a little higher risk of infection. If the physis is not involved, and we are just taking physis as a barrier. Canada also, we are not expecting a physial growth. We just want a physis as a barrier, maybe a little better barrier. So I think in this case, we are getting a very good barrier from the physis, which is a completely open physis in a 10 years. I will not do Canada. I will stay away, resect above the physis and do a reflex. Okay, Pramod. So now, uh, you know... Uh, my question is, uh, now the question, I will take it, take it. If it is a doubtful epiphyseal involvement, what would be the next thoughts? This is, this is the first thing, what we, we are very clear that we are going to transphyseal resection if the physis is, epiphysis is clear. So, in case if there is a doubtful epiphyseal involvement, uh, what would be your thoughts uh, uh, for the board, uh, Mandi? I, I had that... Uh, 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 apprehension while I look at your coronal sections and I see some, you know, doubtful uh, involvement yeah. of the epiphysis. Correct. I would be more comfortable doing the standard osteoarticular resection here. I am, uh, you know, of course, we'll have to see all the images, but I would do a standard osteoarticular resection. Here. Okay. So let's go. Let's process then. Yeah. yeah. I think you see here is the same issue. What you said was there is a fight. If you see in this section, there is a small uh, depth there, which we uh, multi at multiple times we checked with our radiologist and we felt it is not so nice to go ahead with the transphysial. Hence, uh, we uh, you know there is a small moderate uh, virus collapse also. So we thought we'll go with the right. So, so, if you have to do an extra article, I mean, in uh, osteoarticular resection, then then what are the options of reconstruction? That is that that is your next question, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You want to uh, you want me to process this thing? No, no, no. Then uh, stop here. No, let us just discuss it out with. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah. So he is ten years old and uh, he is quite short, as I I understand. Yeah. So you are looking at a limb length discrepancy, significant uh, all England discrepancy. With a standard prosthesis. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so Chetan, if you have to do an osteoarticular resection here, what will be your reconstruction option? Well, it is ideal for a uh, expandable, you know, hmm. mega prosthesis. That is the only solution I can think of. Or the other option is a rotation plasty. Right, that's right. But even with a such a short resection length. Your hmm. expandability would be restricted to four or five centimeters no, at the most. You can reset more. You can use a longer, you know, component. You reset more and have a larger device to okay. fill that gap. 
So Dr. Wong, uh, if you have to do an osteoartical resection here, how are you yeah. going to reconstruct this one? Um, uh, I think uh, we just go ahead for a, a standard uh, proximal tibia uh, pro a tumor prosthesis with an extendable type of implant. So at the age of 10, Although uh, we will uh, jeopardize a bit of the distal femur physis growth, but uh, from our experience and also the published status, it may affect um, 30 to 40% of growth of distal femur. So at the age of 10, I think it's still, it's still okay. <laughs> Otherwise, we don't have a good option to stabilize the knee, just a, a, a proximal TP expandable implant. And given that the patient got a, some sort of moderate response to chemotherapy, so, so a good stability of the knee and also the limb is uh, crucial for the post-op we have. So for this one, uh, doubt the chemo response and also a, a epiphyseal ex, uh, extension, I will just do a, a standard distal, uh, a standard proximal tibia resection with uh, extendable type of proximal tibia uh, replacement. Yeah. Nowadays, you do only non-invasive expandable or you do invasive expandable as well, minimally invasive? Let's say for this case, because uh, how do we choose a non-invasive or invasive? For such a short segment, I will do a minimal invasive one. Otherwise, you will use a non-invasive one. You sacrifice a lot of bone, but only have, can able to have a lesser extent, extension uh, capacity. So for this one, I'll choose a minimal invasive one. Yeah. Okay. So Pramod, you can go ahead. What what was done for this? Yeah, yeah. So we, we considered all the expandable prosthesis. Then later we squared down to as a, uh, the biological reconstruction. Or how do we go ahead? We discussed with our tumor board and surgical tumor board also with uh, my colleagues from Italy, Rizzoli, uh, Dr. Lara Campanacci and Professor Manfrini suggested to say, do a hemiarthroplasty technique. This was one of the first cases we did it, or probably second one, I think, if I'm not wrong, in 2016. So this is there's a beautiful paper written on the same thing with the technical issues where we dissected the, the, as the standard procedure is you go ahead, uh, uh, remove uh, properly the, with the scar, and essentially, the most important is here, we preserved, uh, like I'll pause it now. So what we planned is to remove the proximal tibia and just, uh, yeah. So the standard resections with the posterior uh, neurovascular bundle. And here you go very close to the patella, ten, uh, patella tendon and save the patella tendon at the insertion, very close. And also all the capsular cuts and all are very close to the proximal tibia where we are very safe with the tumor margins where the capsule gets inserted into the proximal tibia. So there we were able to get this good, nice capsule all around. And, uh, and also if you see that even the patella tendon there uh, is also, uh, this is what uh, we use fiber wire to make sure that you know, the, these are very thin and very delicate patella tendon. So this is, and this is a posterior cruciate ligament. We uh, took care of the posterior cruciate ligament and uh, took a suture to the posterior PCL as well. So we wanted to spare the distal femoral physis for the growth. Hence, we wanted to, uh, we did not want to sacrifice the distal femur with the prosthesis. So everything was closely cut towards the tibial uh, side, tibial articular, and most of the soft, intra-articular soft tissues were saved and ligated. Here, we modified from the, uh, uh, the, the beautiful paper uh, what, uh, by, done by the Rizzoli group, where they use the allograft. What we used is we used the pedicle liquid nitrogen. Uh, pedicle liquid nitrogen because we were, uh, by that time, 2016, 2017, we were uh, pretty okay with to do with the pedicle liquid nitrogen, the, all the apprehension and uh, caretaking and all were, we were okay with that. So we used the similar method. So we took care of the proximal tibia with the pedicle liquid nitrogen. And uh, we also saved the periosteal sleeve. You can see the periosteal sleeve downwards so that, you know, it will form a good uh, bone formation around it. So this is a standard liquid nitrogen technique. I'm sure most of you are aware of it. So the measurements. So we took an extra uh, three centimeters of dip into the uh, liquid nitrogen. So we uh, samples of the histopathology sent for the assessment of the chemo response. This is one, uh, uh, we, we wrap them multiple times to make sure that we do not contaminate the field. 
that is one thing we are very much worried about so this is the liquid nitrogen dip pedicle liquid nitrogen done and what we did is uh, once uh, we finished the uh, sorry sorry i'm sorry 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 yeah so we cleaned up the uh, proximal tibia and we wanted to sur resurface the proximal tibial uh, uh, surface so we used the smallest uh, uh, striker uh, proximal tibial component and uh, we implanted into that with just a poly articulation onto that took the fiber wire stitches for all around the soft tissue for the anchoring and used a bit of a longer stem so all these tips and tick uh, techniques of this have been described in the last two papers i'll mention which is very useful i think it's a beautiful uh, lead written uh, so this is what the we took the posterior capsule first first for the reconstruction that's very very important which we always feel that we feel like suturing the lateral part and the anterior part but the posterior is the first one it's always nice to use a like a, a spur string sutures so it gives you a nice uh, uh, thought Yeah, there you go. So, and uh, the gastroc flap and the wound did not close. Hence, we had to use a skin grafting uh, uh, over the gastroc flap. So, if you see that. So, we did not bend the knee for the six weeks. Standard protocol, continue the chemotherapy. This was the post-op. It was one year post-op. And... Uh, so this is two years post-op and this is uh, four years uh, post-op. Yeah, there's a two centimeter shortening now due for uh, the limb length management. But functionally is uh, fantastic. Uh, I think even more the, the thoughts what I came across was the more longer stem. Initially we were putting the plate uh, according to the uh, uh, Japanese, so we came out to the, uh, the with the. I think the longer stem is more better. So at this point, I'll stop, and I'll also share few slides, which was uh, from the uh, standard paper from Rizzoli. So this is how they have written the pictorial. It is a free paper available in PubMed. I think most of they are quite easily accessible, and this is what we felt. And presently, his this condition. I said. The same thing what we said. He's able to do most of his activities with the two centimeter shortening. So we need to uh, do the final uh, uh, corrections and the procedure once he finishes his growth. So that's my thought about it, and uh, all comments welcome. Uh, Mandip, over to you. Thanks, uh, Pramod. This is this is really a, a really an eye opener for all of us. I believe, especially for me, I never thought something like this can be done. Uh, I will certainly want other uh, to point Subin is around. Subin, uh, you your comments on this, your comments, criticism, concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Pramod, uh, well done. Nicely done job. I've not seen one being done before. I just seen the references. Uh, what, what do you think the long term results are going to be? How does the articular cartilage and uh, the uh, the poly of the uh, tibial plate is going to work in the long time? This is now uh, four, four and a half to I think five years now. So once uh, my my thought is once his uh, growth plate uh, I mean is, is is at the end of his growth. So probably the proxy uh, of contralateral epiphyseal this is one thing to the growth to ma ma maintain the growth as the length aspect of it, and probably he may end up uh, having the uh, standard proximal uh, tibial uh, uh, proximal tibial reconstruction of a GMRS or something like that. Probably that would be the final thing. I mean, yeah, probably we can evolve once we get the right imaging at the end of the growth. Probably even we can be more conservatively. Probably you need to you need he needs to undergo something uh, in the future. But uh, it, it depends on his imaging findings when he's six and seventeen or eighteen. Probably. Doctor, uh, one more one, one more doubt I had. Oh, did you reattach the PCL and ACL? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, if you see the screw in the picture there, 
So that is a PCL we have reattached. I tried doing the ACL part of it. I was unable to do it. And uh, uh, that is what I, I, later I thought I should have a modification where I could drill something there and get the ACL also. Uh, oh, what about the MCL? Yeah, all were repaired. All were MCLs. Okay. Everything was repaired. Okay. But, Excellent. Uh, I mean, the Pramod, function is just too good. Uh, uh, Pramod, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 how did you attach the PCL? Where did you attach the PCL? You can see that the small screw, like the, uh, the the remaining bone, what we have liquid that is, nitrogen. Yeah. Uh, that is after after you resurface the tibia. That is after yeah. that you you did the reconstruction of the ligament. Exactly. Exactly. After the okay. resurface, everything. Yeah. It's easy. <laughs> If you, uh, it's uh, it's easy way. If you use these screws, where these uh, scopy guys, the sports guys use it, no, it's beautiful. It's actually you get a nice few screw, few switches across. Is this uh, stem cemented or uncemented? Cemented only in the proximal area, Chetan. Okay, at, uh, okay, okay. Uh, okay. So I, have, I have two concerns. Like first thing is like now the bone is uh, cryo. We have done a cryo for the bone. So yeah. The bone quality becomes weak. So how strong the hold did you get for the future angle? I know because the PCL is very important ligament for us. So, could you get a good purchase? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that day on that day it was good because I think the okay. this uh, liquid nitrogen it starts uh, crumbling after about I think uh, one and a half years, one one and a half years probably. But at that day it was quite strong. Yeah, I think it will not become weak immediately. Is, yes, yeah, correct. Yeah. And second, and second thing is the fibula because the we the tibia will not. But the fibula will start keep growing from the proximal. Yeah, yeah. Did you did you DN, do an epiphyseal disease or uh, some damage to the fibula crisis? No, I, I no, I thought about it. I thought about it. Uh, I was I was waiting for something to happen there. As in, I mean, as uh, these are all the biology things which uh, I mean uh, when I discussed this. Uh, Professor Manfrini. So he said, uh, "Let's leave this to the to the nature. Let's see whatever the problems happens to the fibula. Let's do it later. Like, well, don't because as we can see in the current text, the fibula tip is right at the tibia. Uh, Correct. So I think Correct. The fibula has gone proximally. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. One so question, Pramod uh, Yogesh. Yes. Yeah, okay. Would 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 adding a plate onto the surface would have made a difference? Uh, in addition, because that's what the Rizzoli team does." Yeah. Since most of the cases they will end up using an allograft process as composite and they would uh, routinely do hemis. Correct. Do you think addition of a plate along with the long stem would have helped here? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, plate, we have a, we have good experience in about more than 10 to 11 cases in this kind of a proximal tibial pedicle liquid nitrogen. But every time there is some issue with uh, that, uh, the bone will crumble off and the plate is not a great holder afterwards. So the best is the, what we felt late. I mean, after the learning from the previous cases, we felt the stem is an ideal thing. Probably plate you added, would have added an extra benefit and and it will also add an issue with the wound healing as an open wound and with the skin graft. Uh, we wanted to be minimal uh, thing, minimal in the implants la, and a child. Can you do the same procedure for distal femur or you can't? I think why not? No, Why not? We should be able to do it. We but doing be. doing a pedicle liquid nitrogen would be an issue. Pedicle is a difficult, very very big challenge. Pedicle is a super big challenge. But similar principles we can uh, use, and you know, I think probably we should adapt. There is nothing wrong. I mean, as long as we can save something biological, I feel we should go all the way. And with the good advanced microsurgical techniques, beautiful teams, so many people trained now. I think uh, we should use all the facilities and imaging, beautiful imagings. I think it should be all the way to save the proximal tibia. Any, I mean, either of the physis for the growth. I think we'll have a last comment from Dr. Wong and then we'll move on to the next case. Yes, Casey. So, uh, I think congratulations, uh, Paul. Um, I'm not realizing this it can be done like this. So, um, uh, one one of the questions is, uh, you make you make the hole over the intramatory part and then curate the tumors uh, from inside. So, so so we all have a better access, let's say, for the medial part to make a window and then correct the better for the tumors or, or no need to correct all the tumor from this? Uh, we, uh, Casey, we did this uh, uh, medial wall and all those things. First of all, liquid nitrogen, we felt the, the, the bone quality is not so strong after the liquid mm. nitrogen. So we evolved these things uh, where we could do small multiple holes to prevent the cracking. And mm. also proximal tibia, we are more uh, in control of the contamination rather than the medial wall. So the, as you go downwards, 
even a small drip uh, when you are not holding the leg in a proper position we would be very uncomfortable that drip should not leak into the uh, 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 virgin area so what we do is i think that is it's easier for us to do the proximal tibia and also the pressure will not build up in the liquid and go dip it very slowly so that you know that immediate uh, pressure will not build up and it doesn't crack the proximal tibia so that's what uh, some i see i see <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Pramod. Thanks a lot. Hey, yeah, thanks, boys. Thank you very much, and have a great week. I think it was a it was a great uh, case. I think it's something for new for all of us. Okay, yeah. so now it's what? Okay, it's my time. I'll show. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Yeah, yeah. I will. I will. I will. Pause. Pause. Share. Stop. Share. Yeah. All right. So I'll share my screen now. Okay, so so I have a, a case of Ewing sarcoma of proximal humerus. Um, so I'll run through the case details first. So all right, so this is a, a proximal humerus Ewing sarcoma in a 19-year-old. She was non-metastatic. The disease was from the proximal physis. to almost uh, supracondylar area and uh, you know she responded very well to chemotherapy and this is the these are the post chemotherapy images there is a complete metabolic response uh, on pet ct scan and the disease is right from top to bottom uh, some images the closer look at uh, the distal end where uh, i mean there was no debate over a resection of the proximal end Uh, as you can see, of course, now with Dr. Wong around, uh, even that <laughs> becomes debatable. <laughs> but I, I thought there is no debate over the proximal uh, humerus resection. But anyways, uh, in my mind, the only debate was whether I can save the elbow or not. Uh, so now I can uh, I ask uh, for opinions. If you are to operate this girl, what will be the option for reconstruction, resection, and reconstruction both? Uh, maybe we can have three opinions. Uh, one from Dr. Akshay Tiwari. Akshay, what will you do in this case? So I would definitely want to save the elbow, and okay. uh, preferably use uh, some kind of a biological reconstruction, maybe even ECRT uh, of the whole segment. Even if it's osteoarticular, we have used ECRT for osteoarticular proximal humerus in kids, and at least in the short mid term, they seem to do okay. Okay. Uh, okay, Manish, Manish Puti. So what I'll do is I agree with Doctor Akshay. Like I'll try to save the elbow, but what I'll do is I'll do a extra corporal of the small lower segment. Do a resection at the olecranon fossa, but last seven seventy or eight centimeter I'll recycle, fix it with plates, and then use the canal space. Okay. Uh, yeah. Doctor K C Wong. So uh, I think for this case, for the elbow part, uh, this is so humorous. I'm trying to save. Uh, I'll try to save it because um, I think there's a still quite a, a lateral and medial column that can be preserved. But I'm not pretty sure about the proximal humerus. So actually, it's quite quite yeah. Okay. I, I think for this whether we can save it, I, I need to have a the CT and MRI, and then have some sort of three D bone tumor reconstruction to see whether we can preserve, especially about the the blood supply and also the soft tissue attachment. But for humerus part in a nineteen years old case, um, just a replacement of the at least a hemiplegic type, if we can preserve the axillary nerve, I think should be okay. But elbow wide, uh, by all means, I'm trying to save it. Because it's the bone bone wire, I think it's quite 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 good for bone fixation at that part. Yeah. So if you have to resect the proximal humerus, would you think of uh, doing a reverse shoulder type of prosthesis here? Uh, if let's say whether we we choose a reverse shoulder, whether it's the integrity of uh of the axillary nerve, and also whether we can preserve or reattach the rotator cuff for for the uh, normal shoulder function. So uh, probably the rotator cuff here. Um, I'm not sure. So, just this few images is is probably is not much extra osseous part involved. Yeah, there is practically the, no extra osseous component in the problem. Yes. In the so, in in that case, um, in that case, I would see to try to whether we just do a hemi type of things. 
Um, otherwise, if we interoperatively, we find that we are not possible to uh, change to uh, 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 preserve the release curve or even actually nerve, we because of the modularity of the implant now we have, probably we, we can just uh, do a reverse show that is uh, designed at the time of surgery. But the distal part, definitely the custom one. Need a custom one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe one last comment from uh, Subin. Yes. Subin, are you around? All right. All right, Yogesh, you can take that one. What would you do in this case? Is, is Yogesh around? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you see my video? You are audible, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Fine, fine. So, well, uh, this is what we planned. Uh, we would uh, do an elbow and deltoid uh, axillary nerve sparing proximal humerus resection. Do and of course elbow sparing resection. Do an ECRT uh, reimplant and do a reverse shoulder type of total shoulder replacement within the ECRT bone. So this is what uh, we did. Uh, this is a proximal humerus osteoarticular resection. Uh, the osteotomy was done just at the supracondylar level. Sent it for ECRT. Post ECRT, we did the standard deployment. Put in, uh, uh, did a re did a uh, reimplantation. Stabilized it with, with a medial and lateral pillar plates. It is standard uh, cemented uh, total shoulder uh, reverse linear type of uh, arthroplasty in that uh, bone. And uh, this is the immediate uh, post operative uh, x ray. As you can see here, there is uh, uh, this is the osteotomy, as you can see here. And uh, you know, this is at the end of six months. Sorry. As you can see, the osteotomy has the osteotomy has very well united. As you can see here, the osteotomy has very well united in six months' time. And uh, this plate uh, was overlapping with that with the tip of the stem, so to prevent any stress riser in this area. And this is at the end of six, uh, three months, as you can see, uh, the patient has a little bit of uh, function at shoulder and she has an elbow contracture, as you can see. A uh, little bit of abduction and little bit of forward elevation, uh, you can see. At one year, as you can see, uh, the function has <coughs> remarkably improved. Uh, she has got around 90 degrees of abduction and uh, her elbow is also stretched out uh, significantly. And she has got a, a good forward elevation also. And uh, at two years, as you can see here, uh, you know, you can. Uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry for that. So at two years, the function is far better. Now she has almost 130 degrees of abduction, uh, almost complete elbow. Uh, stretching and uh, almost 120 degrees of forward elevation. So, despite the fact that entire uh, humerus was uh, excised, patient still could have excellent uh, function of the deltoid muscle. And uh, uh, to improvise on this technique for shorter resection lengths, now we have started to uh, do pedicled cryotherapy rather than extracorporeal radiotherapy that avoids osteotomy. Now, this is one case where the resection length was 13, 14 centimeters. This is how you know the, the bone was lifted off. We did a multi-layer careful isolation of the whole thing and then uh, dipped it into the uh, uh, liquid, liquid nitrogen without making the osteotomy. The standard uh, pedicle cryotherapy and uh, then uh, did uh, uh, the reverse shoulder type of uh, prosthesis. We put a plate to protect the junction of cryo and non-cryo bone. And uh, this was the immediate uh, post-operative X-ray. And uh, at three months, as you can see, just in three months, this patient has almost 90 degrees of, of movement on both the sides. Uh, this avoids uh, the uncertainty around the osteotomy and its healing. So this is just, uh, you know, I thought this is worth showing this case. Now I invite uh, the questions and criticisms.
concerns whatever we have. So, okay, Dr. Bandari is around now. I, I didn't see you last time. All right. So, uh, we can have, uh, you know, Dr. Wong, you have any, I mean, uh, you can uh, make your comments on this case. Uh, I just want to congratulate you about this case. It's a great work. Uh, I think it's very good function. So, unfortunately, we don't have this uh, option in our unit, but probably we'll explore for this. So, um, oh, well done. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Mandeep, I can, I can yes, say, uh, senior orthopedic surgeon, that uh, I'm seeing that uh, the your onco, auto onco has progressed so much that uh, really, uh, we are really awed by the things which you're doing. Congratulations for that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I can have a comment from someone, at least Yogesh, Subin, um, Pramod, make your comments. I will comment. Yes, Chetan. Awesome. No, no, not, not that one. Do we have... <laughs> I have, a, I have a few technical queries in this, sir. Yes, yes, we should. sir. I wanted to know when do you cement, sir? Now you, how do you cement the ECRT bone or the cryoid bone, and then do you separately cement the processes from the top? Do you have to cement it like two, two, two cements have to be put separately? How do you go about? Like the first case you showed was really long. So did you cement it from underneath and then put the screws and then again put the cement from the top for the processes? No, 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 no. So the in the ECRT bone, all you have to uh, make sure that is that the cement doesn't come into the distal two centimeters of the bone contact. Okay. So, so there usually you can, you know, plug it up, uh, plug the distal, because it's the specimen is in your hand practically. So you can just make sure that the cement doesn't come near the, near the osteotomy junction and you can cement it from the top. These processes are all cemented. So it, it doesn't matter how long uh, the canal is getting cemented as far as it doesn't come into the contact with the osteotomy side. So that's fine. Even for the end, you can always drill through the uh, through the cement when you're putting the plate. So for the screws of the plate, you can easily drill through the through the cement. There should not be a problem. Now uh, the and also what we do is uh, you know before the cementing we put the uh, we temporarily put the uh, tile implant inside the, the canal and uh, do the uh, do the drill holes for the for this plate. Okay. And then, you know, we, while the cement is setting, you just, uh, you can put the screws while the cement is setting. As far as the pedicle the cryotherapy is concerned, it doesn't matter how long, uh, you know, is as much as uh, the cement goes, it should not be a problem. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's the thing. But it's not as difficult as it seems. It's something which is worth doing. We have now done, uh, I've done around six cases of pedicled liquid nitrogen now in last one and a half years. And, uh, the immediate functional outcome is so good that you know and in, in fact all the patients you get 90 degree plus abduction and forward elevation so this is a procedure worth considering in many cases sir i would like to ask whether you would consider doing this if you are not able to save the axillary nerve no then it's pointless no you that don't have pointless. to do this yeah if, if you are not able to save axillary nerve or deltoid then it's pointless of doing the reverse shoulder type of prosthesis Interesting thing, uh, Mandeep, in your that long, you know, resection yeah. case where you did ECRT. We, we, we did, did the, the, we, huh, we did this case. We did. Yeah. Is the entire deltoid was detached from the bone. Yes, that's Despite true. Despite that, you know, this lady has, you know, shoulder abduction. Yeah. So that's because, you know, ultimately, the, the because the deltoid is innervated, you know, the axillary nerve is, is no, functional. No. What and I'm saying is, at some yeah. point, it is attaching to the bone, to basically to lift it up. It has yes. to get some purchase yes. on the bone somewhere through fibrosis or whatever. Yes. No, Chetan, we have had a case of dislocation and we opened the, to reduce that open. The, we had to do an open reduction. Ah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. When, when I opened it, I realized that all the muscles have again got hmm. reattached to the ECRT bone. Beautiful reattachment and the bone was even bleeding. So probably it is getting, uh, you know, uh, probably revitalized. Hmm. So that's the thing. Correct. All right. I think we'll move to the next case. Uh, we, I'll invite Dr. Mayur Kamani to present his case. Mayur, are you around? 
There is a problem. Can someone take over? Then I'll just fix yeah, it. Yeah, Vishnu, you can start with your case. Vishnu? Uh, yes, sir. I'm just yeah. uh, sharing screen now, sir. Yeah. Sir, am I audible and visible, sir? Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank I you. Do for the opportunity uh, to present my case here. Uh, I will be discussing proximal humeral resections in children should we accept limb length discrepancy. Proximal humerus accounts for 10 to 15% of primary... Vishnu, 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 we can't Vishnu. see your screen. Yeah. You are not shared the screen. Sir, I'm just one second, sir. Yeah. Sir, there is some problem, sir. It's not allowing me to share, sir. Is it? Yeah. No, there is no problem in sharing. Just click the share button. Are you on a Mac or a window? I'm on a Mac, sir. Yeah, so Mac can always has a problem. Can you fix up the problem? Jamin can start with this case. Jamin? Yes, sir. Let me try. <laughs> let me try. Yes. So, can I start? Yes, yes, please share your screen. Just, just a minute. Vishnu, if you have any problem, you can share your PPT to me. I will, I will read it from my side. Mayur has shared his screen. Let him present. Mandir. Okay, okay. Mayur, Mayur has. Okay. So, Mayur, you can yeah. start with. You can see his screen. Yeah. Can I stop? Yeah, Mayur has already put up his case, Jamin, so you can take it afterwards. Okay, just stop. Yeah, you stop, uh, Jamin. Let Mayur, uh, you know, yes. proceed because we can see okay, his screen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Am I audible, sir? I, yes, I yes, Mayur. So, okay. Uh, thank you, Mandeep, sir, for giving me uh, the opportunity. Here screen. I'm presenting. Uh, Make it full screen. Make it full uh, screen. Mayur. Thing is coming in between. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. So oh, any any diaphyseal tumor we know we resect it out. We send it for the ECRT, and uh, we fix with the plate and uh, screws. So here problem is uh, metafacial diaphyseal area unites usually six to nine month and uh, diaphyseal diaphyseal area osteotomy site. That unites in uh, nine to twelve months. Sometimes the most of the cases it gives the problem. We have to either uh, graft it or we have to do another procedure for that. So I, for that, for, uh, for this point, I am presenting a case. So my case is eleven-year-old boy, boy have a complaining of uh, pain and swelling over the left proximal thigh since three months. Biopsy had done. It is osteosarcoma and uh, it is non-metastatic. So this is the pre-chemo image. <clears throat> uh, this is X-ray and this is MRI showing uh, uh, soft tissue extension with uh, bony involution, in involvement. So we can't see the MRI. Standard uh, chemotherapy was given and this is the post-chemotherapy images. Okay. Uh, yeah, fine. Uh, All right. Okay. So yeah. uh, this is another images. Hello? Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you, man. Okay, uh, so can we avoid that osteotomy side? So I would like to discuss with this case regarding that osteotomy side. Uh, Mayur, go any back other to the option images. do we have or any other treatment can be done? Uh, go back to the images, Mayur. Go back to the images. The last slide, yes. Put up this slide. No, the, yes. yes. Not this one. The, the next one, yeah. The next one. Uh, is it okay? What? See, it's yeah, okay. So what yeah, keep so this. What are the treatment options do we have? Like any penalist? 
मनीष मनीष सर आई 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 एम देयर आई एम देयर आई एम देयर सो सो आई डिडंट गेट द क्वेश्चन मयूर एग्जैक्टली लाइक इट्स अ इंट्राओशियस डिजीज एंड यू आर प्लानिंग एन इंटरकैलरी और सम काइंड ऑफ अ रिसेक्शन बट यू वांट टू अवॉइड अ प्रोक्सिमल ऑस्टियोटॉमी दैट इज द क्वेश्चन आई कैन वी यस Hello. Basically, everyone is on the audible. same. Hello. You are audible, Mayur. Yeah, you you are audible, Mayur. You are audible, Mayur. So, yeah, tell me. Mayur wants to ask whether everybody thinks that he needs an intracellular resection or someone. Uh, everybody is on the same floor page. That okay, we need an Any intracellular other... resection. Yes. Correct, correct. so maybe yeah i think with these images i think the intercalary is feasible maybe a t1 or another t2 image can give us a little better picture if you have otherwise i think the intercalary resection is feasible the level we need to see okay where the osteotomy has to be done so i am not very sure about the distal extent of the disease okay so yeah in not proximal the distal the distal extent of the disease mayu so you, so i am not very sure like this for us mayu just mark it out like, for us Hello? yeah mayu can us. Have there is that yeah. what was the disease extent mark it out for us on the screen with your cursor or it may be visible in the pre chemo pre chemo imaging yeah or or show us the pre chemo imaging because because the my problem is whether to choose between yeah i agree with uh, manish yeah. yeah we can't make out you know where is the actual uh, disease ending especially Amayu, do you have any Cannot, other image? Yes, okay. Yeah, pre chemo. Okay, so the disease is only in the proximal. The, you can say proximal half of the femur. Chemo, okay. No, Amayu. So where, where yeah, are you planning your distal? Where are you planning your distal cut? That is my concern. From knee joint line, suppose because I have not seen the imaging exactly. You can tell us distal, the distal, distal cut. cut. Distal cut is below that top tissue. So below that top tissue extension. So it is. So if it it is more than ten to twelve centimeters from the knee joint line, yes, 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 more than ten centimeters. It's almost fifteen uh, centimeters from the uh, knee joint. So then I'll do a pedicle cryo. I'll take a cut proximally. I'll do a pedicle cryo, and I'll I'll add a small plate uh, there. So uh, rather than okay. uh, I I think you did a intercalary resection. I guess. So I'll, I'll, I'll so basically, Mayur. what uh, he is asking so manish you said if yeah. you are, if you have only 10 to 12 cm between the cut level and knee joint then only you will be able to do pedicle cryo so basically yeah basically i don't want my cryo to go into the knee joint so, so suppose i have reached that thupla patellar pouch then hmm. the pedicle cryo uh, because it can actually cryo can damage the cartilage so that is the only concern that i had that is why i wanted to know the distal extent okay, okay. so if the distal yeah so my only concern is to protect the cartilage of the knee all right so if it is more than 8 cm then safely we can do a pedicle cryo and only all have one osteotomy and usually then that doesn't it doesn't give a problem of healing okay so but then in yeah. femur i have never done a pedicle cryo for femur doesn't it give technically difficult because a lot of thigh muscles and bulk is very huge as compared to tibia in femur i think so, the technically it will be probably more difficult as compared to okay. No. so it is difficult but you with, can get a you can get easily actually separate because the the length is not an issue here you can dissect uh, dissect 5 cm extra rather than 3 4 cm extra and you can get a do a pedicle cryo okay so mayur can you show what was done for this case yes sir okay so the standard lat lateral approach was uh, taken and uh, uh only proximal osteotomy from just at the level of lt was done with the separating this and uh, oh, why that this is not working the video is not working okay so the as as per standard we have removed all the soft tissue before uh, doing pedicle uh, before dipping into the liquid nitrogen so we have removed everything we have uh, rim the canal like we have till the uh, the bony extension we have removed the medullary uh, issues so dip into the liquid nitrogen what i do usually i put my hand in between like when the thigh muscles are there and my hand and below that vessel so the thigh muscles and skin don't get necros 
and it's very safe also i just ah oh yeah is it running now it's not safe for your hand <laughs> but your hand can get necrosis <laughs> you no no sir it's contact time okay so i put the video there mm-hmm. if it's fall out also it doesn't so you can make out it's won't mm. yeah so after that 20 minutes dip into the liquid nitrogen 15 minutes at the room temperature thaw this is how it looks like white crystal color and uh, 15 minutes for the normal saline wash so after that uh, what we have done is we have put the digital opposite side digital femur plate put in the proximal part so this is how it looks and this is immediate post op x ray and in this case i had put uh, graft graft also from the iliac crest same side so this is the immediate post op x ray and which has expand till the uh, normal area so within the 3 months we can appreciate the union side this is the 3 months x ray and uh, this is the at the 20 year 20 months follow up sorry that was the 3 months this is the 20 months follow up and the patient doing fine all the activities there is no restriction movement is sitting cross leg everything yeah thank you sir great case uh, excellent outcome uh, mayur thank you sir. thank you sir so uh, okay so this also because he realized yes. that we know that tb for tibia uh, you know medical craft therapy is quite uh, simple and easy but for femur and this patient is quite well built and despite that you could do a nice uh, medical uh, craft therapy an excellent outcome great maybe we Thank can you. have a comment from yogesh yogesh is usually you add uh, uh, vascularized fibula with this kind of reconstructions uh, so what is your take on that yogesh yogesh is there or it is no okay i don't see yogesh around so i think he is there okay so maybe uh, we can have a last comment from um, so maybe dr bhandari sir sandeep uh, dr manglani is here so you can just ask him also oh, is to is it I yes yeah, i just see him yeah he is here hello sir uh, i don't know whether he is around oh he is there he is there i can see him but maybe yeah, he is logged in and yeah yeah he is logged in and then no problem we can move on to the next case vishnu i have downloaded your presentation but before that i think jaimin will uh, finish up because okay. it is still downloading the presentation and everything so let jaimin finish next, off this case and then we'll yeah. take your case as the last case yeah excellent case mayur nice case so i will share my nice. case yes jaimin yes yes please go ahead It's fine. Is that fine? Yes, yes. But it's a very okay. small screen. You why don't you make your screen bigger? Okay. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah, better. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So thanks, sir. Thanks, Insos, for giving me this opportunity. So I will be just sharing a case again. So this is an eight-year-old kid, and as you can see, there is a lesion in the distal femur in the corresponding X-ray and MRI imaging. so we planned this kid for biopsy advised him to get a biopsy but unfortunately he came back to us uh, after this thing having an uh, pathological fracture and we then did a biopsy which was suspected of an osteosarcoma then the metastatic workup was negative so he was given standard map protocol and after finishing this map protocol this was his post chemo x ray and as you can see the fracture had healed uh, I, I cannot say perfectly, but it had healed. Uh, the fracture was uh, pathological fracture had healed, and uh, these were his corresponding uh, MRI images. So I have tried to mark the uh, length of the disease and the distance from the physis and the epiphysis. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this is the corresponding axial and uh, coronal MRI images, just to have an idea of. Uh, what the disease was actually so we want me to run it again or it i think it's fine 
Hello. It's fine, Jamin. Hello, am I everyone? Okay. Yeah, it's okay. fine. Yeah, it's yeah. fine. It's so, fine. So, 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 okay, okay. So, so, uh, for uh, we planned him for obviously surgery, and uh, these are the issues that I had in my mind that uh, we need to have an adequate margin. Uh, obviously, there was a pathological fracture. It was a pediatric patient, so there was there was going to be the question of an anticipated future sleep lack discrepancy. And obviously, whatever we do in our country, cost is always a, a issue. So regarding all these issues, uh, again, uh, the main question was whether a joint sparing uh, resection was possible or not. So this was the question that uh, was continuously coming to my mind that uh, what to do. So whether we can at least save the joint and do something else. So after again reviewing the images, we thought that yes, we can do a joint sparing resection. So after going to the point that at least we can do a joint pain reset and then in the uh, question of if you reset then what should be our plan of uh, reconstruction so whether we should do something biological or uh, do a non-biological reconstruction so again uh, looking to all these issues uh, what we decided was that oh, no, we'll stop, stop. Doing a joint stop. stop 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 here yes yeah. let us ask yes. panelists so here uh, uh, yes, you know, yes. don't have an option just, of I will just go to the images. Ha, please go to the images. Yes. Here we don't have yes. uh, option of reimplanting the same thing. Yes. We can't reimplant the same bone. So ECRT, ECCT are out. Yes. So now what are the options? Yes. These Chetan, are the Chetan and Manish. Yeah. Can I can I uh, just uh, say what I would do? So you can definitely try joint uh, sparing uh, surgery in this. And uh, definitely we cannot re-implant this. So what I would do is, uh, because the resection length seems to be uh, pretty small, I would take a free fibula, double barrel it and uh, do a vascularized uh, fibula there with a double barrel so that, uh, you know, it kind of gives support. Okay. Then Manish. address the limb land later on. Yeah. He's only, yeah. Oh, what is his age? Jamin? Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. Eight so eight years. he's going to have a significant oh. limb land discrepancy. Significant with that option. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So rotation plasty? Anybody? Eight years. Yeah, rotation plasty is certainly an option. I mean, under these yeah. circumstances, he's just eight years old. Yeah. Or a very, yes. and he has got cost issues, so expandable and all those things are totally out. So rotation plasty is certainly yeah. a very viable option here. Mm. Exactly. So, so, right. so these are all. The I would see. I would seriously consider rotation plasty in this case. Correct. My option would be rotation plastic. Manish? Yeah. So similar concern like the if the patient can afford an extendable prosthesis, I will definitely choose an extendable prosthesis or maybe an intercalary extendable prosthesis if we can afford that so that we save the knee joint and we maintain the length. Fine. Uh, but yeah, but uh, if we if the patient cannot afford an extendable prosthesis, then I think we need to seriously consider a rotation plastic or mm -hmm. or uh, doing a plate cement separator temporarily and considering an epiphysiodesis of the other side, that informing the parent that that is going that is going to lose significant height. Because okay. I think with at eight years and we are expecting an... distal femur to, to contribute almost seven centimeters. Correct, Dr. Casey Wong. Yeah. Dr. Casey. Uh, yes, uh, I think for us uh, usually cost is not an issue in in our locality. So um, many of time we can afford that, and also there's a system to uh, help those who can cannot afford the prosthesis. So I think at the age of eight, for this so female like this, we will definitely do um, do a joint sparing resection with a joint sparing type um, of extendable prosthesis. So um, there's a quite sizable part over the epiphysis part, and then we got a good fixation over that. We we ha did have a few cases of this. Uh, in my, in our series, so especially for this one, I, I think uh, the patient respond to chemotherapy and the fracture heals. So there's no contraindication for uh, limb sparing surgery. So um, whether what kind of assistive tool to replicate the resection plan, uh, uh, need to have further study over the bone area. But, uh, but probably navigation can 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 do this because we only have a one cut over the distal uh, epiphysis. So uh, should be uh, should be a, a joint sparing resection. Um, uh, John's uh, sparing type of expanded processes uh, uh, resection under navigation. Yes. Thank you. Jamie, can we, can we, we save five? Can we save five? Sure, sir, sure, sure. 
so uh, this was the thing and uh, um, after uh, discussing with the patients and relatives and <coughs> everything else we decided to move on for a joint sparing expandable prosthesis so in these also we had lot of issues because we offered him the uh, standard of care uh, stand more prosthesis but obviously as the cost was and factor we tried to uh, manufacture an indigenous uh, indian made implant and we uh, take to full consent that we particularly have never done an indian uh, joint sparing expanded prosthesis that was my first concern but everything uh, was duly consented and we went ahead with the joint sparing uh, expandable prosthesis and we did uh, get the help from the 3d printing and uh, we took this uh, planning on the uh, with the help of all the mimic and software which was available uh, just to see where we can have our cut so uh, with the help of all these images we decided that uh, we can we will have a cut just at the level of the pisces obviously we don't have navigation that my setup at our setup so that question was out that we will not be able to use a navigation so then next question was then how will be able to do the cut so the best option was to do a simple iitv guided cut to the pisces and so we uh, went ahead with that plan we did this uh, pre op model and just uh, again recheck that yes we will be able to get a 1 cm of margin if we take a cut from the pisces so we went ahead with this thing and uh, this was the uh, ami implant that we manufactured and we just uh, checked that uh, whether we will be able to uh, rep replicate this thing in trop and pre -op preoperatively this was looking good that yes we will be able to do this thing and this was the implant which was uh, then ultimately uh, uh, got to us these are these are the intro images and as you can see we don't have any uh, navigation we tried to do the customized zig but i was very much doubtful of using a customized zig in such a, a precarious uh, distal cut through pisces so we just uh, did a cut through pisces with an iitv guided cut and these are the images and these are the histological analysis and as you can see it is perfectly matching with our pre op planning that uh, we had got a good uh, margin from the distal extent and the cut was to the pisces uh, this was the intro op image with the implant and this is the uh, intro op sitting as you can see it's not perfectly sitting but after some jargler we were able to uh, sit that implant perfectly uh, and uh, this was the immediate uh, intro op fixation and the uh, end of uh, movement uh, Patient. This was the immediate post-operative X-ray. As you can see, we were able to save the distal femoral uh, epiphysis and uh, save the joint. Uh, this was the immediate post-op X-ray. Uh, this was the we kept patient uh, non-wet bearing for at least two months to let that uh, hydroxyapatite collar uh, have a good hold in the distal remaining femoral uh, epiphysis, and he was allowed to wait there. But we did not allow him to uh, bend the knees. later on uh, we were allowed him without the brace and it was approximately i think uh, four months after the surgery where he was able to walk without any support and we were able to get a good uh, knee range of uh, movement we did expanding once and this was the uh, follow up x-ray i think at least after 11 months of the surgery uh, and that was the thing so i just at the recent call which i got from the patient it was not good for me as i I have just got to know the area. Got now lung metastasis, so I don't know <laughs> what is the prognosis. But this is the uh, latest thing that I wanted to share with you. Thank you, Jamin. Can you uh, can you go back yes. to the implant photograph or implant? Where is the handshake mechanism? Is there a where is the handshake? Because usually this this intercalary prosthesis yes. is there. Yes, yes, there yes. is a handshake. So so what we did. Yes, yes, exactly. So this was a complete one piece implant. So what we did was uh, we just implanted the stem first, and then the distal part, and then just attach both the part with the help of a, a moss taper intraoperative. So it was not a handshake mechanism. It is just a moss taper where we we have to just uh, I, what we do outside the thing. We we did it on the table. Only we, we, we don't need you don't need a handshake here because. the distal segment is sitting on the bone it is not really an intramedullary divide so you can easily you know but it was really 
you still need an handshake no, handshake yes, yes, yes. mechanism it is really easy to fit in with this it had lot of like stretching and all ha ah, so it can still be managed i believe i think the for the perfect it's fitting for, of the ah, components yes. you have to have handshake i mean i would, we would maybe take a uh, opinion from dr ac no uh, see this is an expandable thing no so you can always collapse it and expand it if you want but this is so completely this is, collapsed this is minimum we can collapse uh-huh. Uh, you can collapse it for no the... you can you know sort of manage it that way what i am saying is you can make it slightly shorter than what you need and fit it and then expand it but chetan i think let us ask the experts what yes. is please the expand because as far as i am aware i know uh, is that any intercalary processes is is a handshake mechanism casey dr casey are you yes around? Um, I, I, I'm not pretty sure what was meant by handshake, but this one I, I suppose is a minimal invasive. Male female uh, taper, I think. Sorry, say again. So uh, male would... female taper. That part, sir, I think you want a uh, uh, locking mechanism for yeah. two parts. I think that's what you want to say. Yes. How do you uh, fit in these two pro- two parts? Because I th- I believe one part will be yes. fitted on the distal fragment, another part will be fitted on the. Yes. Okay. Yes. See, the uh, yeah. point is. is this device comes as a single piece or it comes in two pieces one which goes into the proximal fragment and the other which goes into the distal fragment forget about this device you how typically are the devices are this kind of devices dr kc i yes yes, yes so uh, one of the issue is uh, we put it as one piece okay so uh, the first of all we we need to put in proximally put in this stem When I look at this design, there's no extra coating or any screw uh, at the junction, so it's only rely on the cement for the primary stability. But probably they they may know there's no um, secondary type of healing uh, features in this design, so uh, we have to put it in one piece because it's intercalary. So that's why we we for for the design or the fixation that you should not have a too long of the stem or plate or or intra material type of cutting fin. There's give you a very difficult difficulty to to reduce the two fragments together so normally we will take about uh, around 1 cm 1 cm for uh, cutting fin or any intramedullary part that we can uh, pull the soft tissue so that you can reduce it so and also the second thing is uh, for the plate normally we will not put uh, at the true lateral or true uh, me- uh, medial part that is where the ligament insertion is so we, normally we we'll just just put and the anteromedial and the anterolateral part there's a, a space over there because the lander surface can keep you space to put in the scoop without jeopardizing for for the ligament attachment so that's why uh, for for the initial mo- mobilization uh, i think there is some issue for for that especially the flexion extension range that will uh, have a hit a, a, a stress over the ligament part so one of the issue if uh, you cannot use a, a series tool to replicate exactly the plan so the matching of the two uh, the remaining bone and the implant may have some discrepancy and that will slow down your rehab so that's why we stress a lot that you if possible try to get a assistive tool to help you to rapidly plan so that the two part especially the uh, the remaining condyle and the implant can nicely fit together we so that you allow you to walk uh, uh, immediately for all this case we just have a partial weight bearing uh, for four weeks and then full weight bearing and also allow the patient to have a zero to 90 degree uh, flexion on a um, of uh, of hinge brace so just to speed up the rehab yeah thank you thank you right okay jamin I mean, it's a uh, it's a new method that we have uh, seen for reconstruction uh, maybe uh, okay so i don't know sir what so we have any comments or or any questions for jamin manish or uh, uh, um, uh, anyone else wants to ask any question to, to dr jamin shah Right. So then oh, in- I'm good. I'm good. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, good. So now let's move on to the last case uh, from Dr. Vishnu. I'll just start uh, off sharing. Please. Yeah. Thank you, Jamin. So I'll share the yes, screen and uh, I'll present. I'll I'll run through the slides uh, as Dr. Vishnu will tell me. Uh, my screen is visible. Yes, sir. So let's start with this case.
Right. So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, proximal humerus accounts for 10 to 15 percent of malignant bone tumors, with 30 percent occurring in the first decade. So the reconstruction method used should be able to provide long-term stability and allow for early initiation of movement. Uh, next slide. So in this uh, case study, we have a, a seven-year-old female with non-metastatic osteosarcoma of the upper end of the humerus. Uh, she's post three cycles of uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy with a good clinical and radiological response. Uh, this is the X-ray of the uh, patient showing a sclerotic lesion in the uh, metadiaphysis. Next, sir. This is the MRI showing a, a, a soft tissue mass, which is, uh, which is there, which is also involving the deltoid. So this patient will require a deltoid uh, resection as well. So, this patient, what are the concerns? The concern is this patient will need the proximal humerus replacement, but she's only seven. So, how that I will reconstruct this with nail and cement spacer uh, and accept the limb length discrepancy that is resultant. Uh, what are the other's opinions? We can. I concur. Okay. And, I don't uh, see any other option. Yeah. All right. Uh, Okay, Manish. Sorry, I missed in between. What was the age of the patient? Seven, Seven years. Seven year old girl with non metastatic osteosarcoma. So, yeah, the limb length discrepancy is definitely a concern because most of the humerus growth is from the proximal humerus. So, we can consider some biological options here with a, a, like a free epiphyseal transfer of the fibula. Sorry. Okay. Fibula with the epiphyseal growth. Dr. Casey Wong, this patient, how will you manage this patient? For, for a seven years old um, uh, child for proximal humerus. So probably uh, for for this case, I would do I would do a proximal humerus extendable type of processes. Oh. So um, yeah, just to preserve the glenoid growth and then see how, how it goes. If uh, the patient not responding too good for the preoperative chemotherapy, cement spacer is one of the options. So uh, if the patient uh, uh, responds very good to the preoperative chemotherapy on the clinical or radiological aspect, so normally we will do a, a, a proximal humerus expandable prosthesis. Because of the age, probably we will not do a reverse, just reserve the growth of the clinical and then see how it goes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, so Vishnu, you can, you can tell us what you did. Yes, sir. Next slide. So, so the issue that we are basically trying to address is for the growth of the proximal humerus as uh, as rightly pointed it uh, contributes to 80% of upper limb growth with an annual growth rate, for, growth rate of around 0.7 to 1.3 centimeters. Next sir. Uh, so what we tried to do is we tried to get the fibula uh, 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 to grow. We tried to replace the humerus with a fibula which would subsequently grow uh, as the child grows. So this epiphyseal vessel to the proximal fibula physis is actually a direct branch from the anterior tibial artery. And it is the first branch that arises from the anterior tibial artery immediately after the uh, bifurcation from the popliteal artery. Next slide. So this technique was first described by the Italian group and uh, they have uh, they currently have the largest series of uh, 24 patients and they have demonstrated uh, excellent growth in uh, patients. Next slide. Similarly, we have got uh, papers from the Birmingham group as well, uh, but these are all uh, smaller uh, case studies of around four patients only. Next slide. Uh, so this paper actually demonstrated the growth of the fibula, which was re-implanted in the place of the humerus, and they have documented growth of between 0.5 to 0.18 centimeters uh, per year. Next slide. So just a few words on the uh, surgical technique, and there's one more case, uh, uh, which also I would like to show two variants of the same surgical technique. So this is basically this, uh, the intraoperative images. You can see the glenoid, radial nerve, brachial vessels, median nerve, everything is preserved. Next slide. So this is basically what was done for the fibula. We approached the anterior tibial artery between the uh, tibialis anterior and the extensor digitorum longus. Uh, you can see the CPN is uh, uh, protected, dissected free and uh, uh, protected. You can see the anterior tibial artery and vein. Next slide. So you, here you can see the epiphyseal artery, which is... I put the pointer also here. This is the anterior tibial artery and this is the epiphyseal vessel which is coming out to supply the uh, fibula physis. And this is the peroneal artery. This is the peroneal artery. 
So we, we have basically harvested the fibula based upon two pedicles. One is the peroneal pedicle as well as we have protected that uh, epiphyseal artery as well. Next slide, sir. So when we are resecting the fibula also, it's important to note that we have to take a one centimeter or two centimeter cuff of bicep so that it can be uh, hung from the, the glenoid. You can clearly see the epiphyseal artery because of the age of this patient, this epiphyseal artery had, uh, had good length and you can see also see the peroneal vessels also. Next slide. Here we can see the anastomosis where the peroneal artery is anastomosed to the profunda brachial artery and the epiphyseal artery was directly anastomosed to the posterior circumflex humeral artery. And uh, we have sutured a mesh to the biceps tendon and secured it to the acromion and secured the fibula to the humerus with a, a plate. Next slide. We use the skin paddle for uh, checking the vascularity of the distal fibula. And here you can see the immediate post-operative x-ray. Next slide, sir. Now, uh, on serial radiograms, we have seen uh, around one centimeter growth in one and a half years. But unfortunately, at one and a half years, patient developed uh, uh, metastasis. But this technique did show that uh, we are able to achieve growth if the epiphyseal uh, vessel is preserved. Next slide, sir. I'll just show another uh, similar scenario, but a different surgical technique was used. Uh, this patient is a two-year-old child with a osteosarcoma of the proximal uh, uh, humerus who developed a pathological fracture on chemotherapy. He also had a pretty long length of disease, but uh, the pathological fracture had clinically and radiologically united. So here you can see the resection. We have saved the uh, uh, musculocutaneous nerve. This is the median nerve. You can see the radial nerve and this is the resected specimen. Next. Now in this, the variation that we used is that we have uh, because the child is very small, the epiphyseal vessel is going to be really small. So what we did in this case is we resected the anterior tibial artery right from its origin and uh, uh, which was going up to almost uh, uh, which three-fourth the length of the uh, fibula. Because in children who are under four years of age, the vascularity of the fibula comes both from the anterior tibial as well as from the peroneal. So this fibula was harvested on the base of its anterior tibial artery uh, pedicle. We did not attempt to dissect the epiphyseal uh, vessel at all. And we kept a cuff of muscle uh, from the origin of the uh, anterior tibial artery right down to almost its middle third. Next slide. Uh, in this slide here, you can see this is the takeoff of the anterior tibial artery. Here you can see a cuff of muscle which is placed, uh, which is kept around that. So the epiphyseal artery is actually somewhere within this cuff. We have not attempted to dissect it at all. And here you can see in the next slide, we have got uh, next picture, we have got a, a, a cuff of uh, biceps also. Now here we have done a retrograde anastomosis. So we have actually anastomosed the distal end of the anterior tibial artery to the profunda uh, uh, brachial artery. So the vascularity will actually, actually come in a, a retrograde manner and we have secured with uh, uh, plate and screws. Next, this is the immediate post-op x-ray. This patient was operated only a couple of months ago, so I don't have follow-up x-rays. But I just wanted to show the two variations of the same epiphyseal transfer of the fibula with two different uh, variations in surgical technique. So the advantages of doing an epiphyseal fibula is that it's a biological reconstruction. It's pretty cost effective. It allows for longitudinal growth by prevent and prevents unsightly limb length discrepancy, excellent long-term functional outcomes. Uh, disadvantages include long surgical time, need for microvascular surgeon. And since it's upper limb with rem limited remodeling, uh, because of non-loaded joint, there is a higher risk of uh, fracture. And most of the papers which have actually shown, actually demonstrated a fracture of the fibula, but it actually, all of them united without any problem. And they actually continued to grow as well. Thank you. Good case, uh, Vishnu. Excellent case. We can have maybe some comments. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. So I have a couple of comments. Yeah. So yeah. So Vishnu, excellent case. So there's only one uh, one or two small concerns. Like in a very small child, I, I agree. Like suppose uh, you are basing it only on the anterior tibial artery. Okay. But uh, in a little older child, you are basing on the epiphyseal vessel as well as uh, the peroneal artery, but you are not monitoring the epiphyseal vessel. And being very small muscle, you don't know what is happening to them. So why not based on an anterior, uh, anterior tibial artery in a little older child also? Because your primary concern is the growth. And if even if the fibula this, remains... This, listen to me. Listen to me. Yes, listen to me. Listen to me. Even if the fibula remains avascular in the lower part, you are anyway spanning it with the plate. So it is like a, like a dead bone or a fibular graft. But main concern is the growth which will still happen with the anterior tibial vessels. 
and if if the fibula fractures or if it doesn't grow uh, if it doesn't heal or it, it, there basically risk with a with a fracture because the fibula is not vascular in the middle or the lower part but your growth part you will be taken care of because if you are doing a anterior tibial rather than epiphyseal vessels because with that you will be much better much more sure about your anastomosis uh so uh, sir uh, both the resections were more than 7 cm or so so it's, yeah. i was we were very worried to put a non vascularized uh, fibula only sir because we were we were and considering the high rates of fracture uh, we thought that we should definitely vascularize both both the ends actually and uh, coming to your point about the growth there is actually a watershed age like uh, after the age of around 4 to 5 years the amount of contribution of the anterior tibial artery to the vascularity of the fibula actually reduces and it becomes more a uh, peroneal artery based so which is, is why in the older child we did both anastomoses of the epiphyseal artery as well as the peroneal you have not in the monitor. second child we just based uh, the two year old child we only based it upon the anterior tibial we didn't do a but second anastomosis not monitored the epiphyseal transfer what is happening to it because distal part you are monitoring with the skin pedal yes sir but no. there was growth sir on serial x ray there is no way to monitor it i completely agree but there was growth which shows that it was functioning How do you measure growth uh, on X-ray? I mean, just a sir. I oh. use the from the top of the screw till the uh, angle of okay. the angle on the lens. Okay. Okay. That's it. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And uh, what kind of movement can you allow, especially where you are doing this epiphyseal repair? You know, sir, it is the same as the any proximal humerus resection. Sir, we put an arm pouch for six weeks because we have used the mesh to secure it uh, to in the top. Uh, we okay. start elbow range of movement immediately because both the patients we have put plate it was stable so we started elbow range of movement uh, without uh, gravity gravity eliminated elbow range of movement started immediately and we use an arm pouch for 6 weeks and uh, both the patients have got uh, resection of the axillary nerves sir, so they won't get any shoulder function sir. so why did you use mesh you didn't suture the biceps tendon only to the shoulder capsule was there a requirement of a mesh sir i put a mesh because i was uh, I, i i felt the fibrosis would be more so probably you can just directly suture it also okay uh, what do you lose by putting a mesh i think oh, the growth sir because if you tightly suture the mesh because the epiphyseal vessel is right there no sir if you see the uh, the mesh is put only in the bicep tendon so it's a very small piece of mesh okay so you oh. suture you put the mesh it is completely supra it is above the, the mesh does not come in anywhere near the fibula head it is all above the head of the fibula okay. then it is fine then it is fine i agree right that's in the okay. excellent case uh, maybe we can have final two comments from one from dr sanjeev bandai and one from dr kc bong and then wind up this uh, uh, webinar yes. thank you mandeep thank you on behalf of ii uh, indian orthopedic association and president uh, dr shivshankar who happens to be my colleague i really thank you for letting me on the panel and learning a very very new techniques uh, which are taking place in ortho oncology and i am sure the younger orthopedic surgeons will definitely be uh, motivated to take up such uh, limb uh, uh, challenging limb salvages and i am happy to be a part of this uh, webinar today thank you very much thank you very much sir dr kc yes thanks thanks all of uh, uh, i really enjoyed the great uh, webinar i actually is all the case amazing and never uh, see, imagined before i i definitely learned a lot than i i share so a uh, great uh women uh, congratulations for for that thanks and and thank you very much for being in the part of this webinar sir that added a yeah, lot yeah. of value to our webinar yeah. your presence made a lot of difference and of course uh, the, not to undermine the presence of any of our uh, own colleagues but i don't seem that uh, i don't have to be formal enough to thank all of you i mean uh, in, in fact everyone i mean uh, chetan uh, manish yeah. uh, jamin uh, pramod uh, prateek everyone i'm sorry if i missed any on on any names but thank you very much for taking out time on this sunday morning and being part of this uh, webinar and uh, i'll uh, continue to see you around and uh, uh, we'll we'll uh, in source we'll continue to hold uh, uh, two meetings every month so one is the last sunday of uh, every month uh, which is going to be a four hour session and every second wednesday evening uh, we are going to have a virtual tumor board alternating with an ortho radiopathy meeting so the next webinar is going to be on 12th of october Uh, which is going to be a virtual tumor board, uh, uh, wherein uh, the medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, surgical oncologist will discuss uh, clinical situations and scenario and take calls on patients' management. So I'm looking forward to having you all again, and uh, I'll uh, you'll all get the link uh, of the same program soon. Thank you very much, and have a great uh, remaining Sunday. Uh,
Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Bye.